OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, half past seven Friday morning. A very good morning to you, wherever it is you are at. Delighted to have you with us here on OTB AM on this Friday morning. Owen, good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. What a stonker of a weekend we have, particularly Saturday. You're actually going to some live sport. How the hell are you going to manage to take it all in? How am I going to manage to do it? I mean, it is a tough life, isn't it? Tough gig. Yeah, very, very tough gig. It's not actually, there's not actually a whole pile of volume. It's just the quality that people are going there's to be There's a lot of volume with. too now, to be it's fair. Just, it's just one, there's only one overlapping moment really, and that's yeah. the Leinster football final and Leinster's rugby final. And there's a chance that one of those games could be a blowout. Both of those games could be a blowout. Oof. You think the dubs could, like, turn it up? I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know. If Kildare plays badly as they did uh, against Westmead, I mean, they beat them by three points, but that that is possible. I definitely think we'd be doing sure. very well if you've got both of those screens on and you're nervous if you're a Leinster fan or a Dublin fan going down to the home stretch. So mm-hmm. 60 plus minutes or 70 plus minutes in, in, in GA and Rugby's case, respectively. If you're still nervous about the outcome of those two games, we've done very well, I think. And I think that both of those games would have been a cracker because you can't just look at Dublin either you have to accept that Leinster being favourites for this game at the weekend the manner of the win against Toulouse uh, in the last round suggests that they have the potential to blow anybody away uh, in this competition so there, there, there's always that life possibility with, with Leinster I hope that's not the case and I hope we have a mm. real good contest but yeah it'll be dual screening central for that after uh, a sunny Killarney that afternoon it's going to be a great weekend for anybody who's going to the provincial finals which just absolutely makes it and it feels that this is the beginning of the Irish sports summer it feels like we could be doing more with the fact that there's four trophies to be given out this weekend and like just pitting the uh, Leinster final up against uh, the Leinster match just seems to have been I mean they're just missing a trick there I do think they're missing a trick in the marketing side as well like I mean I know look at the Super Sunday thing sometimes tends to be over egged a little bit when you end up with like you know Wolves against Newcastle on a Super Sunday or whatever but like I mean what a what a weekend for four tro- it's uh, somewhat unprecedented yeah it is like it I, sort of fl- flies under the radar a little bit like we had this conversation on the show yesterday and I'm, I'm not overly I'm not overly bothered about this fact that the GA are going up against other sports I think that that's there's a no, and then you're on two feet lads don't bother to you. but that's not what I'm saying like I think it's like what, what? What? What would you do? Like what? What's What's the alternative here? You've got four provincial finals. The TV broadcaster has to show the Champions League final as well. Would you do some sort of a mad Sunday situation where you just roll them all off on a Sunday and you do like back to back to back to back to back, and they're all live televised and they're all this is huge. I know you'd have might have started at like ten a.m. in the morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I think I'll take three o'clock and five o'clock on a Saturday. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you went like twelve to four, six, four, six that'd work. What about extra time? What about the people? Like, so who's who's your six o'clock? Straight game? to penalties. Who, who's your twelve o'clock game? And who's your six o'clock game? Like, maybe your twelve o'clock game is Kildare Dublin, but sure they never put the dubs on that early. Six has to be your best one. So this weekend that'll be Roscommon Galway. Yeah, uh, Donegal Derry. I'd probably Roscommon Galway. <laughs> like uh, and yeah, maybe I. I, I, I don't You're not having so. that. No, I think that I think if you've got four provincial finals all into one week, two on a Saturday, two on a Sunday works perfectly. You 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 happen to be clashing with one of the biggest European weekends of the year. So be it. Like I mean, I I don't know. I think I I think the GA will will survive the fact that one of their games, one of their games, clashes with another sports game this weekend. There I are did, still three other it's, games. It's the fact the, that it's the Leinster game against the Leinster game, and that's the. It's like if it was if it was the, if it was any other game by that one, you'd be grand. Yeah. Like I mean, they, they would they could flip it. They they could have flipped it. They could have in late notice, but Dublin would always be the Saturday night slot. Mm. When you look at the quarterfinals and the semi-finals when they're all in one weekend. The trend that I've noticed since the calendar has been uh, compressed a little bit is that Dublin always get the Saturday night slot. That's mm. just the, the way it works with Croke Park. They, they so have shown flexibility around, I think it was some of the football matches last year, and they probably should have done it here. Like it I, I don't know what the uh, a number of people that won't turn up because they'll be watching the rugby will be, but it must be at least in the few thousand territory. You would have thought, flip it, make the money from the tickets... Great day out for people. You go and check out the GAA, go to the pub afterwards, watch the match. In in this scenario, probably, but at, at the same time, they feel that Saturday night would get more people in the gates, especially fill the hill out on a, at five o'clock on a Saturday and three o'clock on a Saturday. And it's something that's worked for them uh, commercially very, very well over the last few years. So uh, that seems as sacrosanct as anything at the moment. Mm. The dubs in the I'll, late Saturday slot. I'll be watching it all from the couch in the company of a cheese board and a nice glass or something on. Adrian just moved his laptop towards me a few minutes ago, people, and said, oh, look at that photo. And I was like, what are you showing me here? And it was a photo of a cheese board. <laughs> what did you think of it? it? It was, yeah, it looked good. Come on now. It looked great. Oh, sensational. A friend of mine sent that on to me during the week. 
That's that is saucy WhatsApp content right there. <laughs> Cheese board born. <laughs> 25 to 8. That's uh, what you get on OTBM on a Friday morning. Brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's coming up uh, between now and 10 for you this morning. Uh, Kevin Kilban uh, is going to touch on loads of different bits and pieces. Uh, Everton celebrations of the pitch last weekend. Uh, some Champions League final chat, obviously. We are going to talk Saipan 20. Uh, and there's some good stuff in that uh, about that. And uh, also a slightly bizarre topic that he's been tweeting about the last little while. Um, and no better place than OTBM on a Friday morning to talk about the best ginger footballers of all time. That's Kevin Caban a little bit later on. Shane Kern is going to look ahead to that monster weekend of provincial finals particularly the Connacht final of course. Uh, I'll be picking my best Leinster 15 from all of the Heineken Cup finals including tomorrow um, and that'll be coming away at 25 past 8 this morning so any thoughts about who should make that team um, get them into us. Gareth Roberts uh, from the Anfield Rap will join us at 20 to 9 to look ahead to that Champions League final. Quick picks Ashling and Tommy uh, both live to make their selections for this weekend. Live crappy quiz as well at 20 past nine. Who's on that own? It is yourself versus Tommy versus John Duggan. Oh, wow. JD, come on home. Bring the trophy home. And Tim Vickery, Vickery from last night's show as well at 20 to 10 this morning. So that's what's uh, coming your way uh, over the course of the morning. A reminder that we're calling all cycling enthusiasts this week. Skoda are the official main partner of the Tour de France and to celebrate here on OTB Sports, we have a once-in-a-lifetime giveaway, as you can see on your screen there. This amazing prize a VIP trip to stage 13 of the Tour de France from the 14th to the 16th July. It includes flights, accommodation uh, for one winner and uh, whoever it is that you choose to bring with you. All you're going to need uh, for your chance to win is to be available to travel on those dates, 14th to 16th of July. And uh, to enter today, just name this Irish cyclist who enjoyed 17 years as a pro competing uh, 24 Grand Tours. His dad was also a cyclist and if you don't know by now, he reached the business end of Dancing with the Stars. Who could it be? You will still see people taking risks to get a shot on TV in some crazy costume. You don't need to hear that again because uh, it's pretty obvious from the clue. Just tweet your answer uh, into us here at Off The Ball on the, uh, or on the OTBAM Twitter account. Each daily winner is going to win a €100, euro, one for all voucher and a Skoda cycling jersey. And we'll go into the draw for the grand prize. Uh, best of luck to that. Skoda drivers, by the way, for another chance to win, you can check out skodaservice.ie. Right, it's coming up on 20 to 8. Delighted to have you with us. Keep the comments firing into us over the course of the morning. Uh, but right now on a massive weekend of sport, uh, we uh, managed to get a few minutes in the company of the great man Kevin Kilban back in the show. OCB AM. All right, oh, time to uh, turn our attention to football, and we have a lot to get through with our next guest. It is an agenda that is uh, that fill fills over. Uh, Kevin Kilban, how are you getting on? I'm good. I'm good, Adrian. Good to see you again. I've not been on for a while, have I? It's been quite a, a quite a long time, really, since I've spoken with you. Hasn't been for the lack of trying on our part. Well, apart from a few private messages, you know, we send each other a few WhatsApps uh, a couple of times a week, don't we? Apart from that, but we're, we're, we're in touch enough, but just not uh, not on the, on the show or anything. I get a weekly review uh, into my phone some Friday afternoons, some Saturday afternoons, and I have to say, to be fair, it uh, can be very cutting at times. I think it's quite reasonable, you know? Positive, positive, positive feedback, positive and negative feedback, whichever it is, I'm giving you feedback on the show. You know, I've, I've got a lot to say about Owen when I'm, when I'm messaging you as well. A lot to say about, about Colm over the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to be said at times, isn't there? A you lot that needs have... to be said. A lot that needs to be said, I might add, yeah. I played, uh, I wouldn't be in the habit of sharing the information you send over, but I did happen to be in Colm's <laughs> company yesterday, Friday, uh, last Friday evening. I did play him the uh, bit where you weren't happy with him. You weren't having his... Uh, like, what are these Everton fans doing celebrating on the pitch after the Palace win stuff? No, it, it wasn't that. that. There was probably, there's probably a little bit of that. You, I, I can understand that. You, know, you, you, give, you, you take what he's saying, things like that, that's fine. But it was more that he actually wanted to look at it through the eyes of what Roy Keane would think about it. Not his, It's not even his own opinion now. He's looking at somebody else to get to gather an opinion from, isn't he? So that was quite interesting. That was the interesting take that I, I took from it, really. Roy Keane, he brought up Robert. Roy Keane. <laughs> Roy Keane puppet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never would have known, would you? The, ma the man's obsessed. There is, and like, not, we don't need to get into it right now, but there is definitely like a post Saipan. Well, this is the right things, the right way to do things. That wasn't all bad, by the way. I definitely had like uh, a positive impact in the country in terms of like best practice and you know how we we shouldn't be settling. I look at it's it's not really 
the debate about Everton being on the pitch. You were um, delighted, obviously, post Palace. They yeah. packed up packed up the bags after that, obviously, last weekend, but job done at that stage. I, yeah, I'd say there'd be some partying done um, after that game, wasn't there? It was... Um, no, I, I think it was job done. I, I, I think you touched on it, and you, you touched on it. Regardless of how a season goes, Everton's, you know, priority at the start of the season or target at the start of the season was not just to avoid relegation, but... When when we get to thirty and thirty two games, the realities in front of you, where Everton are, you've got you've got to deal with the situation that you're in. And um, I think I, I'd sent a message to you, Adrian, hadn't I, about that there was a great interview. You know, it might have been on the World Feed, it might not have been on Sky with uh, Michael Keane and uh, Dominic Calvert Lewin. And you could hear in the voice of Michael Keane what he was saying. Uh, you know, the expectancy of playing for Everton. I, I remember when I signed for Everton, and we've got. You know, Bill Kenwright, the chairman, would would come in and and, and speak to the players here and there, and he'd, he'd constantly bring up former players' names. We had Dave Hickson, who was a club legend, who would be coming round the changing rooms before the games, and you know, we were always in the shadow of uh, Alan Ball, of um, Colin Harvey, Howie Kendall, Andy Gray, Graham Sharp, all these players because of the rich hist- history that they had, and. That club was on the verge of relegation. You can't get away from that. And the players were feeling it, regardless of who's wrong and who's right, who's to blame for Everton getting themselves in that situation. And the wages that Everton are paying now, astronomical wages, they should not be in the position they're in. We all know that. But they're still human. They were still feeling that pressure for the last six or eight games of the season. And I, I think it's full credit to them. And maybe even Lampard, I think you touched on it yourself, Adrian, you know, to, to galvanise the club and... I think Lampard recognised that he had to get the fans on board with him to really take to Lampard before even they take to the players and the club itself. I think there was a bit of that. Lampard had to really get to get a feeling for what the fans wanted from him and maybe what he wanted from the fans. And to, to, to get the turnaround the way that they did in those last few weeks, it, I think it was a special end to the season for them, really. And yes, we all know it's not where Everton should be, you know, given what the pain transfer fees were paying. The Frank Lampard commentary obviously is uh, fairly regular. What's your thoughts on him? Obviously, he, he done enough now to uh, to move on. Obviously, next season and all that. Are you? Uh, having him in the parlance? Um, uh, personally, I, I think he was probably a little bit... I, I, I was going to say lucky then. I wouldn't say lucky. It's maybe a wrong thing to say. But I think fortunate to get the job in the first place. Um, if I was looking at where Everton were in at, at that time, the position that they were in, there wasn't really much to suggest to me from Frank Lampard's CV that he was able to you know, take a club in the bottom half of the table and get them safe and, and start to rebuild. Did a good job at Derby. Obviously, didn't get them promoted in what he did. Chelsea's budget and the players that they had and everything was always going to suggest they were going to be a you know a top six club. That was how it was going to be. So, I didn't necessarily see the fit for Everton personally when he, when he got the job. But um, I think he's I think he's proved certainly that he's he, he's in touch with the club. You, you know, we've seen all the little clips that have come out on social media you know we've seen the bit where he was talking about Seamus Coleman and talking about the players and the group of players that he has there's a rebuilding job yes um, Lampard will obviously oversee that with with us at the club but I think he's I don't know he's grown on me that's what I would say I do right. think he, he, des- he deserves he deserves the uh, the job uh, long term now and I would like to see him given a good crack at it and, and you know a lot that you know maybe the club can move forward with him now and they can basically build something, hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that something can be built that's quite special going forward. Without looking back too much, obviously, on uh, the end of the Premier League, Kev, the Champions League final obviously took ahead to this weekend, Liverpool against Real Madrid. There were parts of that game, I'd say, uh, at the weekend, the, the Liverpool Wolves match where, geez, they looked really heavy-legged in a way that I thought, God, even regardless of what happens here today, this could have an impact next weekend. Is the Champions League, the sort of mm. Champions League final, the sort of a game that you just are able to put all that stuff to one side and it doesn't catch up with you? Or is there a point in the game where you've just become so tired from uh, from the season that like no matter what you're doing, an hour, 70 minutes into the game, it starts to hit you? It probably depends how the game's going, doesn't it? I think we're all in reality. But if, if Liverpool are a couple of goals up, two or three goals up, it, it does become easier for them. If they, 
if they're struggling to, to break down uh, Real Madrid and maybe even a goal down or whatever it would be and they're, they're chasing the match, then that tiredness can can seep in a little bit. But I, I don't know. I, I I honestly felt at the weekend, I, I know it didn't really go the way that I, maybe I expected it with, with City going down 2-0. I, I thought City would prevail and get and get the job done. I think many, many of us all thought that. Um, so there was a little bit of maybe looking towards that Real Madrid game, not necessarily quite at it. I'm sure that Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp wouldn't say that, but it, it looked a little bit that way to me. There's always a bit of madness around Liverpool, isn't there, I feel? I think that's what makes Klopp so warming. There's always a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't know, just, just, just chaos around the team. I think when you're watching them, you, 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 it's never as controlled as Man City. The City seem to control games. And with Liverpool, you always feel as though there's a chance that's going to be given up, however that's going to be. So... I think that's going to be the case this weekend, but um, I think Liverpool are a better team. I think they'll be able to raise the game. And in answer to your question, I think I think Liverpool will be will have enough on the board so that legginess and that tiredness won't necessarily uh, be as uh, be as prevalent. I think maybe at 16, 17 minutes. It it feels like a very very interesting build up where the night Real Madrid beat Manchester City or that week certainly there was a feeling that you know Liverpool are are heavy, heavy favourites for this game. They still are, if you look at the, the betting lines yeah. for this match. But it feels the general conversation has changed a bit over the last couple of weeks. It's almost like a build-up to an All-Ireland final where the underdog almost has mm. a chance more the more the days go by, even though there's absolutely no evidence for that. Yeah. It feels like that's the way the conversation has moved for Real Madrid over the last couple of days. Like, Do, do you feel that as well? That, that increasingly, I guess if you throw into the mix Liverpool's injuries, that you're starting to, to come around to the idea that Real Madrid really could upset the odds at least this weekend? Well, I mean, I'm not saying you, 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 you're you basically asking me to sit on the fence, aren't you, with what with what I've already answered. I think Liverpool <laughs> will win the game, but um, but no, I, I think we all know with what Real Madrid have done, with those amazing comebacks, with what Karim Benzema has done this season, you look at what they've achieved in getting to the, I think getting to the final was an incredible achievement for Real Madrid. I, I didn't think they'd, they'd probably get out of the last 16 this season. It didn't look like the, the Spanish sides were really up to it compared to where they'd been in maybe uh, five, ten years ago. So for them to get to the final and do what they did against City, first of all, because let's be honest, now, 180 minutes against uh, Man City or whatever, including the extra the extra time, 200 and whatever minutes, they were outplayed. They were outplayed. If, you're, if I'm looking solely in the 180 minutes in the two-leg games in normal time, they were outplayed for probably 175, 170 minutes of, of that tie. And they found a way to win the game. So they can be outplayed in the game. Liverpool will create chances. Liverpool will be having that real high pressure game, that real, you know, dynamic running style that they've got. And it's hard to play against. But Real Madrid have got have found a way this uh, this season to stay in matches. And they've got enough quality in midfield with Modric and Cruz and, and people like this that can control the tempo of the game if they are under pressure. So I, I get what you're saying, but... I, I don't think Liverpool have got too much. I think defensively, I think they're better than Man City. I don't think they'll they'll let what happened uh, happen. Uh, what happened to Man City happen to them. Um, and I think they can deal with crosses a lot better. Real Madrid cross the ball a lot more than than maybe most sides do. Like from from what I've seen, certainly getting into wide areas, they put the ball in early. And I think Liverpool can deal with that more. I think they might even get behind Liverpool's fullbacks. They might get into crossing positions. Uh, but I think Liverpool will be able to deal uh, a lot better than Man City could with that. And I, I, I think Liverpool could win this 2-3-1. or three, one. I, I do think that. I, I, you know, 2 one's not necessarily convincing, but it might be a late goal for Real Madrid. I, I, I think this game could be comfortable enough for Liverpool, really. Like on that Real Madrid point, like there's been a bit of debate on the show over the last couple of months about whether Ancelotti is a good manager or a great manager. Like, where, where is where is he in in I guess the the general notional rankings in your head? Like, is he a top five manager, a top ten manager in Europe right now, or uh, or, or where do you see him? Uh, well, I, I, I from even from when he's when he was at Everton, I'm sure you know you'll probably speak into people that were involved with him uh, in in years to come. I'm sure of that as well. He's he's not necessarily a coach. He's not. He's not Jurgen Klopp the way that he, you know, is on the training ground or like Pep Guardiola is on the training ground constantly. He's, he's there, but he's not necessarily got the, the full hands-on day-to-day like those other coaches have. So from if you're looking at it from a coach, he's probably not in the top 10, no, but he has a way to, to get the best out of players. Yes, on the training ground, maybe little, little drops of information that he'll give the players. But certainly, when it comes closer to the game time, he's been there, he's seen it. You know, certainly, as a player, he's seen it. Certainly, as a coach, he's seen it. And players are able to, to, to take on board what he says. So, 
I think I think for what he's achieved, certainly in the last ten years, Owen, maybe fifteen years, there's been no better coach in the Champions League, has there? So you have to give him the full credit he deserves for what he's achieved for that. So there's more ways to skin a cat. That's all I would say. There's, you know, it's not necessarily about being that hands-on coach every single day on the training ground. It's sometimes it is about taking that step back and evaluating what players you have and being able to talk to them, being able to speak to them. I think there's a lot of coaches don't have that skill. Personally, for even, even my experience, I found that. And I think Ancelotti, I remember listening to Mark Lawrence, and I think he was on with you and Jero, and where he was just saying about he's a, he's a good guy. He's a, I think people do warm to him, no matter what walk of life you're from. And I think he has that charisma about him that, that players can actually really attach themselves to. And I think that's where he's at his success. And, and I think that a good guy persona has really been kind of played up as well over the last couple of weeks. Not that he's been trying to do that, just it helps that you have a title win and all your players are on their phone yeah. and like you have the sort of affable old fellow with the cigar and the sunglasses and like that helps yeah. the image when, when we're talking about it. Just just on, on the flip side then, Kevin, with regards to one of the big storylines from Liverpool's side of things going into this week, it is of course around Mo Salah. Mo Salah saying that he's going to be at the club next season. Sadio Mane says he will speak to the media after the match and shed some light on his future at the club. What do you think is going to happen here? What's your gut telling you with regards to those two players? Uh, I'd look at Mo Salah and probably it's where he's going to go. Um, you know, is, is it solely going to come down to finances for them? Uh, Liverpool, as we probably, every, most would know, probably can't compete. And be able, probably, they might not even be able to compete with, with Newcastle in the Premier League over the next few years, but they can't compete with Man City when it comes to, to wages. They can't compete with, uh, with PSG when it comes to wages. So if you're going to throw in, you know, an extra whatever million to a player a year when he's earning... 150, 200 grand a week, whatever it would be, is that going to make a difference to him? He, he, he has to see somewhere where both Salah and Mane have to see somewhere where they're going to be going to win trophies because Liverpool are in a prime position right now to be the dominant force in Europe or one of the dominant forces in Europe in contention for every trophy over the next two or three seasons. And before you know it, how old Salah now, Owen? It's, he's approaching he, he 30, be, isn't he? He will be 31 next summer. So he's going to turn 30 this June, yeah. Yeah, so if you're looking at that, you know, if he gets, he might have two or three years at the level that he's at. Certainly, if you look at the amount of games that he's played over the last few years as well, obviously not wanting to tempt fate for him for his own career, but he's played a lot of games at such a high tempo, something I feel would always have to give when you're playing at that level. And it's the same with Mane as well. So unless they're going somewhere... Uh, to, to to seriously compete, I, I don't see the need for them to be going for to play for, for for PSG or Real Madrid or whatever it would be, unless it's personally the personal prestige and whether it's something that's within that wants to play for those clubs. They're not going to get any better than Liverpool, I don't think, in terms of um, trophy contention over the next few years. So I I, I personally think that, that it, their best option is probably to stay. But I'm not in their camp. I don't know what's happening around the agent. So. I was even reading about um, Moussa Dembele today, which looks like he's leaving uh, Barcelona. Barcelona are not meeting his agent's demands, which is crazy when you think about it. It looks like he's going to sign for PSG because they can meet his agent's demands. It's not coming down to what a player wants now. It's what an agent can demand from clubs. So this, these factors are going to play in. I don't know who uh, Sané's agent is, or Mane's agent is, sorry, and I don't know who Salah's agent is, but... These agents now play a big role in in, in dictating where, where the players go, solely down to their their own uh, their own financial gain. We'll see what happens at the weekend. You pinned your colours to the master already, so I'm not going to ask you for a prediction on that. We do have Sorry, Us- of- Usman Dembele. I got the name wrong there. Usman Dembele. Sorry. Sorry. We're throwing Sane, Sane in there as well, so there was all sorts. Yeah, of- I know. I, you know, you know. We got sorry, the gist. Sorry, we got the gist. We got yeah, the gist. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, you were uh, tweeting a couple of things during the week that we wanted to talk about. One of them was the uh, David Connolly, Jason McIntyre, um 20 year <laughs> celebration, Kev. Is that right? From the 2002 World Cup, the Saipan anniversary, I think is how we're, how we're terming all. Terming, uh, terming Saipan anniversary. Um, uh, yeah, 20 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the yeah, I think, I think Jason, start, J- Jason started off his piece, didn't he, by saying, I'd love to bury it in what was that show that used to go and bury oh, it? Room 101, ne- yeah. Room 101, never, ne- never to be seen or heard of again. Yeah, I think there's a lot of us that feel a bit like that, yeah. Um, but that notwithstanding, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, he's David Connolly is sitting on the greatest Irish sporting documentary never made. Those yeah, tapes, I know. You were, you were, you're on those tapes. I think so. Maybe on there somewhere. Probably most. I mean, all I remember with Dave, Dave's walking around with his camcorder. I think it was almost after the 
Nigeria game. It might have actually been over when we went over for the for Quinny's testimonial at Sunderland. I think Dave starts with the, with the camcorder, and you can imagine what the lads are like. Just Dave, get that fucking thing out of my face, will you? Will you go at the back? And Dave's like, "Oh, what do you think about this?" And imagine what he's, imagine Kenny. Can you just imagine Kenny with a camcorder stuck in his face when he's like, you know, uh, when he's getting ready for preparing for a training session after he's had a bath for an hour and he's stretched on the corridor for two hours to get himself prepared for for a session, you know? Um, it's funny. It's funny when you think about it now that I, I think I've said it to you guys in the past privately when we've been speaking. I'm glad it's I'm glad it's all out there now. Dave has had this tape for years, and I, I, I've not spoke too much to Dave about it. it. But it's crazy to think that even you know leading up to it, what happened? Dave was walking around with his camcorder reaction on the bus after training, before training, all these sort of things, and also that. In the aftermath, what happened? Dave, Dave's got the tapes there. I think there was a rumour going around that Dave had the camcorder set up in the meeting that night. I'm not too sure how accurate that is, but the, the camcorder set up uh, in that room and it was playing. But again, I don't know how, how accurate that is. Like you, I know the lads were talking about it during the week, but if you had that, you would be, I mean, I think it would be you know, <laughs> half name in his price anyway, but bloody hell, that would be sensational. <laughs> He doesn't, know, he doesn't actually have that, does he? It didn't seem like during the week that that was something that he was I never said that. that. There was a rumour. I think it was, I think it was Brini has said that at one time to me, that he actually, the, 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 the camera was rolling. Whether or not it was, you know, they were both in shot, but certainly the, uh, I think there, there was a rumour. Again, I don't know audio. That's what I'm looking for, Owen. Yeah, the audio's there, but I don't know how true that is. The, uh, the entire affair um, obviously rests on this idea of the feigning injury bit, the faking injury bit. And Keane saying that McCarthy accused him of faking an injury to miss out in the Iran game, the second yeah. game, you know, that it was it was out of sight. And then there's so there's and then after that you start to unpack that. There's all this stuff about an arrangement, obviously, between Ferguson and McCarthy, that if there was a positive outcome in that first leg, which suddenly they understood it to be the case. Um, but a misunderstanding almost kept uh yeah. between that and what Mick McCarthy was actually asking him to apologize to the squad over. Is that fair enough? Or, or sorry, yeah, per, is that pers- your reading of it? I don't want to be putting words in uh, Yeah. No, uh, no I, I've said it before, though. I've said it before, Adrian. I, I, this, I, I hadn't seen this this line coming out from Roy, actually, that he was accused of feigning injury. I, I didn't see this video that came out, and he must have said it on that video. I don't know. I'd never watched the video. I didn't even know there was a video out. Honestly, God, I didn't know that. Uh, I'd never really heard the, heard the line from Roy that he was accused of feigning injury. And it probably stuck in my mind more. I was listening to a podcast that Roy was working for ITV, I think, on, um, on the World Cup in, in Russia. And Roy said at the World Cup uh, that, you know, he goes, well, what, what was I supposed to do? I was accused of feigning injury. I had to defend myself or worse to that effect. And it was, I, I, I never heard that. I don't think any player has ever really been asked that question. Did you hear Mick McCarthy tell Roy that he feigned injury to miss an Island game? I, I've never, I've never heard one player even answer that question. Uh, that so, was, I, that was on. never said in the room. No, but it was never said never in the said. room. Right. Well, I mean, there was honestly, it, it was never said. Now it could be misconstrued uh, that 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 was said. What Mick said to him was Mick had obviously brought up this article that Roy had written with Tom Humphreys and. Uh, and he was talking about that and he wanted an explanation for him writing this piece. And, and Roy had said, he said his piece, uh, whatever he'd said, I think, you know, people get the gist of what Roy had said to Mick and Mick said to him, well, do you not think you all the, these lads an apology because they went to Iran and finished the job. Do you, it, it, that, it was a, an apology for what maybe Mick had read uh, from what Roy had said about us in this piece saying that maybe a lot, some of the players aren't, up to the standard and, and not, I think, I, I don't even know what was said in the interview, but in, in that interview with Tom Humphreys, I'm just guessing, but there was, there was worse to that effect that, you know, we, a lot of the other players in the squad were questioned on maybe ability on maybe their desires and all these sort of things. And I think I read it, I read it that back then that Mick was looking for an apology for that. Look, can you just apologise, lads? These lads went to Iran. They actually got the job done over in Iran. You, you weren't there. You went back to play for your club, Man United. And you didn't come and see the job through with us. It would, wasn't. Would you, have, I, would, you have, would you have expected an apology for that? No, I wouldn't have expected an apology. But I, whether or not it was a, it was a provocative, um, you know, message that was said to Roy, looking for a reaction, you know, from from that yeah. look. Whether it, yeah, whether because, or not why, because was, why was he asking the question if it wasn't I don't know expected. honestly. Yeah, but you'd have to ask Mick on that. But it, it yeah. certainly wasn't. It certainly wasn't saying, look, you feigned injury to miss an Ireland game. 
that was never said, absolutely never said in that room. And, and you know, and I'd probably say that the, every, what everybody else that was in that room would probably back me up on that, that they never heard Mick saying, look, you feigned injury to, to, uh, to go back and play for your club. There was a, everybody knew there's arrangements lots of times when Roy, Roy didn't play friendlies. Roy stayed back at his club because he had injury issues and that was just the way that it was. There was no, there was no issue with us at all for that. We all knew how it was. We, we we would have all preferred Roy having Roy for those big games, and that was it. Personally, from my point of view, that was the biggest game of my career, those two legs. And I look back on my career, and maybe they were the biggest because it was that final hurdle and actually getting the job done. So that's how I look at it. But there was no suggestion from Mick to say that... The per- I never heard that. I didn't hear that. And, I, and I'd love if that question was ever asked of the players. Look, did you hear Mick saying that Roy feigned injury to go back and play for United? Because I don't think that's... That was how it was said. Now, that's how Roy probably took it. But even in that moment, I didn't read it that way at all. It's become, uh, it's become fact almost, is not it? Like, I yeah, it, it has become fact. I think, it's unf- I, think, I think that is unfair that. I said that. I'd never, I never heard that. And that's where it is. And, and I, I've, I've never heard Mick being asked that question. Honestly, I'm sure Mick's probably spoken about it. But has Mick ever been asked the question, did you accuse Roy of being an injury? And I'm sure I'm. I've never. I've never spoke to Mick privately about it. Honestly, I haven't. But I'm sure that Mick would probably would undoubtedly say I. I didn't because I never heard it. And it, I, honestly, as far as I'm concerned, that was never said in that room. So, if if that's how it was, how it was, you know, um, how how it came over to Roy, then that's how it came over. But no, I didn't. I didn't actually read that uh, like that at all whatsoever. No. You'd nearly think like Mick McCarthy should have come out at some point in the meantime. I know you're saying he's never been asked about it, but like, geez, you just want because it's such a fissure over here in terms of the split that's created that obviously, uh, 20 years yeah, ago. But I mean, the, the split was there anyway. You know, I, I, I even listened was it just to a reason? Like, is, 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 that, is that the essence of it? Was it just everybody looking for a reason to have a row? Um, I, listening to lads, you could probably get that opinion the other day, uh, didn't you? You know, there was a there was a long journey. We we flown via I don't know what what I I can't remember. We did we flew Dublin Amsterdam I think Amsterdam Tokyo Tokyo Saipan and you can imagine that we we done a lot of travelling and you know whatever you people might say look prima donnas or whatever you know narky little arseholes or whatever it would be um, but there was a lot of tension yeah there was a lot of tension around the squad yeah there was particularly when we got there and the kit hadn't arrived that was the big thing wasn't it the kit doesn't arrive and everybody's now. Tetchy, edgy, mix, obviously totally pissed off that the kid's not arrived, but we've got to make do with the situation. And that was how it was. So we had to do some sort of training session and we did. Um, and then we turn up for the on the pitch and the pitch is horrendous. The worst pitch that, you know, we've, we've all played on some awful pitches in our time, but this was as bad as you're ever going to see. There was holes, potholes all over the pitch and we're, we're supposed to be preparing for a World Cup and this pitch is the, 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 the pitch that's been put on for us. So there was a lot of things you can imagine, can't you? You can imagine there's probably a few tackles going in training, a few flaring elbows going about. There was a lot that was happening. And then throw in the mix that the goalkeepers are not taking part in the game. You, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm probably trying to paint a picture of it there, but you can well imagine that a group of lads together that have been, you know, we've probably been caged up at that stage for only a, a, a week or so, not even that. But there was a lot of tension, yeah. There was a lot of tension, and uh, I think that's probably what it all spilled over. I think certainly Roy had his uh, said his piece to Tom Humphreys or did his piece with Tom Humphreys in the Irish Times, and then it went it went from there, didn't it? There, there was a moment in the interview that Joe Malloy did with uh, Mick McCarthy in 2018 when they were speaking in the aftermath of the Jonathan Walters saga, where. Roy Keane accused him of spending a little bit too much time on the treatment table. And McCarthy said, you never accuse a player of feigning injury, do you? And Joe said, no, that's a load of common to make. McCarthy said, or do you have the right to do it? I don't know. And Joe said, are you saying that you didn't? And Mick McCarthy said, I'm not saying anything I did. Uh, so cryptic, but uh, yeah. it, it has it has kind of half been put to, to Mick McCarthy. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I was in on that interview with Joe as well. I was there with Joe when we interviewed Mick. Um, I don't even remember him saying that, to be quite honest with you. But no, I, cryptic, yeah, fair enough. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's something that maybe Mick, Mick has been reluctant to speak about. I don't know. I, I, whether or not I, I missed something, whether or not that had been said privately between the two of them, I don't know. It could have been because they, they had had a series of meetings leading into that. So that could have been said privately. I don't know. That's... 
that's my whole point. It was it said privately, and that's what's maybe flipped everything up. I, I mean, I, I've said to you guys as well, I remember before that meeting start, Roy said it's going to go off tonight. So the, the meetings that they'd all had prior, I was sat next to Roy eating dinner that, that evening. So I was sat next to him when they were having the conversation with Mick. So, um, you know, they could have, that could have been brought up. That could have been said to Roy privately, to him personally. That's why it went off the way that it did. I don't know. I don't know. That's why there's, there's so much within it that a lot of the players that even that were in the room that witnessed what happened at the end of it, there was so much that happened probably prior to that that we 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 never witnessed and we would never be privy to. You had dinner with them that night before the meeting? The night before the meeting, sorry, say that again. Is that, what, what, when did you have dinner with them? No, yeah, just... that... 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 No, during 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 the meeting the fallout, I was sat next to Roy when okay. the fallout was happening. Yeah, right. I thought you knew that, didn't you? Yeah, you knew that. Yeah, I think I remember talking about it before. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. we, like, we don't need to talk about it now, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I come here one one last one for me. The Jason McIntyre interview I thought was interesting during the week because in the middle of it he said, "If I've done anything, if I said anything to upset him, then I apologise for that." I've never heard Jason McIntyre being as conciliatory as that before. You're grinning as if to say maybe he didn't really mean it, but it did feel as uh, if it was something, he was saying something by way of an olive branch in so much as it would ever be accepted or in so much as it's worth. What's the, what? You, you're obviously in a different part of the world now and you don't bit, bump into him at games and I'm sure you're not uh, having a huge amount of texts over and back anymore, but, mm. um, you know, what is the feeling toward him now amongst the other players? Is there any warmth, respect? What is it? Yeah, I, th I think Dave Conley had even said it the other day. You you have to respect Roy totally for the player that he was and what he brought to our team. Roy was just an absolutely incredible footballer. Even listening to to I was listening to Jer and Owen. I think it was on the morning of that when I was listening to their show, and and Jer said Roy was the best in the world. And you know you can make that you could easily make that argument that Roy was the best yeah. in the world. And personally, I would probably say I would probably agree with Jer in saying that. Honestly, would. There was no one better at controlling a game across the world, I don't think, world football than him. Or he, you could actually put him up there with with anyone. There was a lot of players within that Man United um, team that people will put, try to put on a higher pedestal than, than Roy, Scholes. Maybe some might even say Beckham or whatever. You know, honestly, it's it's crazy because I know, for a, I know even speaking to the guys that play for Man United around that time, that the one person that they trusted and relied on to take the ball, to do... Uh, to control the game, to to you know, if they needed something, a, a bit of life brought to the game, it was Roy. Roy was an incredible, a incre incredible player to dictate the, the you know the tempo of games and all of this. But Roy was an incredible player itself, full stop. So we all have an, an amazing amount of respect for Roy uh, from what he brought to our team. Absolutely, yeah. But <laughs> as well, what do you mean? Fun. Well, like if you bumped him, no. if you passed him in the street right now, would you? Would there be an acknowledgement almost? I don't think he'd acknowledge me. I think that's probably what it would be. Um, there's a, there's a lot of fallout. I, you know, I I'd probably out of nearly all the teammates, there's, 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 all my teammates that I would have played with you, I would always say hi. I, I speak to very few, very very few uh, that I would have played alongside. But there's there's still lads that you know that I'm in contact with, and I'll chat to them. Uh, but there's lads that I haven't seen for a long time, and you could sit down and have a conversation. I don't think it would be the case with Roy. No, I think that he would he would totally ignore me and, and everything that I have to say. So I think there's a lot of players that's in that position. And that's largely down to this. You're asking yeah. us questions about Saipan and you're asking us to, to give our opinion on it. And if we give our opinion on it, I give an opinion on Roy once where I felt he was maybe a little bit out of order where he was talking about players prior to 2016. Uh, the Euros when he named the squad and Roy came out to name the squad. We, it was down in court, wasn't it? Down at Turner's Cross where we played mm. Belarus and the squad was announced that that day, after I think, that, that evening. After, uh, was it after that? I remember that game, yeah. Was it after that game it was announced? Yeah, just after just that before? game the squad was yeah. announced and Roy criticised Aidan Begidi, he criticised a few players and I felt, I, 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 I was asked the question when I was on air, I said, look, you know, your assistant manager saying that and I, I personally just, I just said, I can only imagine sat in the dressing room with Roy Keane if, Ian Evans, our assistant manager, or Chris Shooton, or Noel O'Reilly, that, that I would have played in the same team uh, under. I could imagine what Roy would have been saying if those assistant managers would have been coming out criticising those players like he did. And I, and I said that. I said, 
I just can't imagine any other assistant manager criticising the players the way that Roy has criticised those players right now. And I think it is wrong. I don't think it's right at all. But um, when you say things like that about him, it, you know, the... the uh, um, the the uh, the fire has almost been set, and hasn't it? There's, there's no there's no comeback in Roy's eyes. You've criticised him, and that's it. He, he he won't talk to you again. He wasn't happy with you. No, not at all. Not at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want me to elaborate? There's nothing else to say. I got a text message off him, and that was pretty much it. So that's pretty much the end of that relationship. Yeah. Um. Now you said the uh, internet live a couple of weeks ago, Kev. Uh, it was about a thousand responses between your tweet and Stan Collymore's getting involved with various other uh, high high profile celebrities, um, and right. I think you've come to the right home for uh, for having this discussion about the greatest ginger footballers of all time, um, <laughs> because you know there's at least two of us here, Kev, who are uh, who are fully signed up members to that family. At least two. I'm not yeah, sure if you're I'm, fully signed I, up, Adrian. I, I'm signed up. Well, he, no, he's not signed up to anything. You know, he changes he changes his spots every week, that boy, doesn't he? You know that. We know that. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't know where he's from, Owen. He doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't know who he is. So he just, you know, he tries to make out he's from Athlone. You never would have you never would have known that. Any anyway. of the three of us has an identity crisis. No, I do have a bit I do have a bit of ginger in me. I do, yeah. My beard in my beard as well. Now I've got a bit of a messy going on with my beard. Uh, Messi obviously got me. Could you claim Messi? Can you claim Messi for a could. ginger? You probably could. Yeah. Oh, gee, yeah, there you go. I've got mine's going grey now. Mine's going grey in my beard uh, where my ginger was. But no, I've got I've got a bit of ginger in there. Yeah. So we've we've tasked you based on you'd thrown out a tweet saying that who who are the greatest ginger footballers of all time? And there was, as I said, there was about a thousand responses to it. So we've tasked you with, uh, firstly, giving us the five players from your era between then and now, uh, five greatest ginger footballers. Got? Yeah, well, no. If we're going about the greatest of all time, I have to stop you there as well now because Jimmy Johnson. I know I'm a Celtic fan. I was a Celtic fan growing up, and Jimmy Johnson was always the name. Little Jinky was always the name. So, I I probably say the greatest of all time is Jinky Johnson. The greatest ginger of all time is is, is Jimmy Johnson. Everton as an Evertonian, everyone would tell me Alan Ball. Alan Ball is the greatest ginger of all time as well. So we. We have to start by saying those two are not in the mix because we haven't seen those two play. You and I, and, and Owen, Owen especially, hasn't seen those play. Um, but we have to, we have to throw some, uh, we have to throw those two names in right at the start. And I'd probably say that's one and two in the, the best gingers of all time, just to start with. And now okay. we can move on to to our era. It's not even Owen's era now because Owen probably won't remember some of these names. You know, yeah, that's what makes you feel old. Well, some, sometimes I listen to the show when you're talking to Owen, and you'll throw a name in from. 1990. I, I, I'm trying to think. I, I can't even think of a name now. Uh, a name that would have been quite prevalent to us or quite prominent to us watching Stephen Premier League. Stefan no. Effenberg. No, right, think, well, let's, think... let's throw that straight away. Stefan Effenberg straight away. He's got to be in the mix, hasn't he? He's got to be in the yes. top five. Owen's probably never heard of him. 100%, top, now, has 100 it? top five. I think also as well, you, you sometimes make it, you sometimes get confused between my youth and my stupidity. Uh, so having not heard of a player doesn't necessarily mean that I was just too young. I could just yeah, uh, be completely, yeah. completely uh, ignorant to their existence, you know? Yeah, all right. All right, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one as well then, yeah. Um, but trying to think of, yeah, I, I, I was actually trying to message you some names today, uh, um, Adrian, wasn't I? Trying to get you some names sent across to you just so you'd bring them in mind. But obviously, obviously, if, if you're looking at medals won and talent and everything like that, Paul Scholes, obviously. And I've got to say Billy Bremner as well. Billy Bremner's one that we never would have seen as well. Another wing. G- Giles, can talk about um, Billy Bremner, I'm sure, at some stage. But he was another ginger as well. But, uh, I think the a, greatest a ginger player. footballers of all time to John Giles, I don't think it's an item that's going to go. It's not going to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you say if you say, what you say to me, say look, Kevin Kilban says that Paul Scholes is better than Billy Bremner, yeah, and then yeah. wait for then the response. Away. That's the, away. Then and you know, we should we should mention that it was actually the entire thing was kicked off by a Kevin De Bruyne masterclass a few weeks ago. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. in terms of the current, well, De Bruyne is right in the mix now. De Bruyne, yeah. De Bruyne is probably going easy into that top five, isn't he? Uh, yeah. if, if people people always talk about, you know, you can never judge a player on 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 how good they were unless they've won trophies, which is absolute nonsense in, in my eyes, honestly. You, you, you judge a player on the talent that they've got on the pitch and what they do and that wow factor. And Kevin De Bruyne, he has that wow factor, doesn't he? Kevin De Bruyne, every single time over the last, especially over the last four years, I think he's taken his game to a whole new level. And he, I think he's getting better. Even watching him at the Euros last summer where 
he, he was injured prior to the Euros and then he came on in that uh, Denmark game, wasn't he? He came on in the Denmark game at half-time, scored a brilliant goal with his left foot. If Belgium are going to have any sort of chance of winning the World Cup uh, this year, it's got to be down to Kevin De Bruyne. He, he's the, the main man, the best midfield player in the world, without a doubt in my mind, and um, the best player in the Premier League over the last few years, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt. Just an incredible player. And as I said, he gets better and better. You've got uh, Big John Hartson. You've got Gordon. Oh, we've, got to, we've got to throw. We've got to throw Big Johnny, haven't we? We've got to throw yeah. a, a side of. I mean, are we going to throw Damien Duff into the mix? Are we going to throw Oliver Kahn into the mix? I think These Oliver Kahn makes the ginger. Duff or ginger. Oliver. I, uh, Duff, Duff, blonde. Duff would say blonde. Some strawberry might say blonde. strawberry blonde. But if, if I'm throwing these like names like John Hartson into the mix, who is a bona fide ginger, and I've known a lot of gingers as well in my career as well that literally, you know, we're, we're afraid of showing the roots. So, that, you know, we can we can go but to that one another day. Some gingers? Who, who no, got... not at all. Not at all. No, there, there were, but there's a few, you know, I don't know if you did that yourself, Owen, um, whether or not were you growing up, you were, you know, you were embarrassed of your ginger hair, you decided to dye it blonde or dye it black or anything like that. Did, did you ever have that feeling? There's nothing wrong had with the, being ginger. I had the feeling, yeah. I had the feeling, but managed to resist the did feeling. You? I thought the eyebrows would be a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> did, you? did you? Well, no. It, it, right, you know, I'll ask you an honest question. Then. So, why were you embarrassed about being ginger? Was it just the stigma that people would just give you? Like, I'm not being funny. Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Just like, the, the stick you'd get. You've got, you've got, a good, you've got a good head of hair on you. What, what's the, what's the big deal? No, but exactly. it's just exactly it's like anything that makes you a point of difference from the majority of other kids in the schoolyard. You're like, Correct. I don't want to be. I don't want to stand out. I just want to blend in. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. Co- that's correct. But when you get to a certain age, it doesn't really matter. Does you? You don't care, do you? Do you care? No. You does does it affect like, you? Does it affect you in your in your adult life? No, not at all. And in fact, it's kind of you're looking for points of difference once you become an adult because your life becomes yeah. uh, quite routine and boring, and uh, there is nothing to yeah. set you apart from anybody else. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know now. what your relationship status is now, Owen, but I'm sure that your relationship status has been enhanced with having ginger hair. No. Absolutely not, but I'm, I thank you for having that uh, opinion. I'm glad that uh, a male footballer a million miles away uh, has that opinion that being ginger is more attractive. Well, I don't know. It's, 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 it's what's been said in the past to me. You know, I've, I've known... Um, really? I've known, yeah. But anyway, that's... There you go. I, 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 did, I, did, I didn't have the ginger hair to back it up, so, you know, I, I've got nothing to fall back on there, really. That's why I was trying to show my beard off, you know, to say I'm really ginger. No, <laughs> Gordon Strachan. <laughs> let's, let's... <laughs> Steve Nichol, uh, John Arnorisa, you've you've down here. I mean, he's got. I don't no, know that he was ever sort of. I, I never. I'd never been putting John Arnorisa. I think you threw to me, threw back to me, Steve Staunton, Adrian. I'm, Stan is Steve Staunton, his head, 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 Stan is head and shoulders above John Arnorisa. I've got to put that out there right now. So. If we're looking, if we're calling Stan a ginger, which he'd probably say blonde again, but Stan's ginger. Let's be honest. Um, he is right in the mix as well. Stan has to be in the mix there. Brilliant player that he was, you know? Coleman, Ronald Coleman. Oh, yeah, K- Kuman, yeah. Well, again, one of the best European um, European Cup uh, winning goal. What, what, what year was that? Uh, 92, I think it was. 91, 92 at Wembley for Barcelona. So, yeah, great career. Brilliant, um, yeah, top top class. So we were looking for five there. I mean, I can... Oh, it was with Mateus Sammer. Uh, who else is yeah. there as well? Boniak um, is one that, that came up with... Boniak, yeah. Well. Boniak, yeah. I mean, he was brilliant, wasn't he? Polish striker, brilliant himself. Uh, I'm sure, again, there's going to be lots and lots of names, even when this goes out, that's going Ray to be Parler, thrown off the back of him. Ray Parler, did you mention him? Uh, Ray, Ray Parler, yeah. Ray Parler. What you a player, what a man. When you're what a man. I, would, what a man. I will toast a Cobra bomb to Ray Parler's gingerness. <laughs> 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 and what about and what about I mean like a few of the we've got to give a few Irish players yes Paul McShane Paul McShane like, good friend of I, mine Paul head of hair. You know, Here, I think I think there's a separate list for the most ginger players of all time and I think at the top of the list oh Dave oh. Kitson good shout, good shout. Uh, and, and you know what as well Gary Doherty or Gary yeah. Doherty as they say in England um, Alexi, you, Alexi you Lallis of course the, ah, well, he was the, just poor wasn't he he was a poor player so you can't be throwing Alexi Lallis into the mix Dave Kitson is so ginger, even I would take the piss out of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've got a lot of respect for Dave Kitson because he qualified for Ireland and said, look, I'm not Irish. I, I, I'm not going to play for you. So I've got a lot of respect for Dave Kitson. Yeah. So do I. Mark, Mark Noble. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, and, I mean, there's half of them there that we mentioned, Gary Darty, the, the uh, James Collins. They get, you know, this idea of the ginger Pele. How many players have you heard called the ginger Pele? And it's never, <laughs> let's face it, 
it's never meant as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably say so. Yeah, and, and I was saying before about you know the mocking. Yeah, I, I I probably would have done it in in the past myself. People would have picked up on my you know um, bad looks or whatever. People would and be coming for me for whatever reason. They're going to come for me. So I would have probably bit back at someone and said you ginger so and so in the past. Yeah, uh, just a way to get back at somebody. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Was Sean Thornton a quiet ginger? Yeah, Sean's another ginger, wasn't he? Yeah, good player, died, Sean as well. Died blonde. I'd say most people would, would remember that. Yeah, died blonde. Um, and then I, I was even thrown um, uh, Tomas O'Shea threw into me as well. Of course, it's the Gooch. So there was loads <laughs> yeah. of like Gaelic footballs thrown to me. But if you're if you're having if you're having if you're having the Gooch, then I simply have to have Kieran McDonald. He's a ginger, surely as well, isn't he? Is he? No, ah, it's got to be. He no. surely to God, yeah. That, that said, herd's been dying. No chance. As soon as someone starts dying the herd ten times over, no. then you, you, you've got to start asking questions, haven't you? If Kieran McDonald is ginger, that really does change the whole scope of my childhood. Like he was the the sex icon of the two thousands. I could have pointed to him instead of pointing to Prince <laughs> Harry as the the go to ginger person that I aspire to be. <laughs> But this is this is, I, I I will not accept that. Yeah, uh, I will not. I think, I, think, I think I think I think I think I think Kim McDonald is a, is a secret ginger. Yeah. Uh, hey, Boris Becker, of course, but we can't uh, we're not we can't talk about him anymore. So um, yeah, there's there are that's it's a whole other conversation for a different day. We, we draw the scope open a little bit more. I'm not I sure know, we're I on five, Ken. But, I know I probably bored you on it now as well. I bored no, no. you on it, yeah. But, but I, there... say, I, I I did put the tweet out to say yeah, I've been chatting to a friend about the best ginger football of all time, and it was you, Adrian. So I have to say yes, that yes. I was chatting to you that day about who these uh, top five gingers are, and I said it should be a segment in the show. You and Owen yeah. Friday morning. Oh. A ginger sports star, male, female, whoever. Well, to bring the conversation full circle, I can't wait for the review of today's show. It'll be coming through tomorrow afternoon. You'll be like, that football segment, I oh, dragged the arse out of it. It was supposed to be half an yeah. hour. Ended up as 45 minutes. Um, uh, you got me on for 50 minutes. 50 minutes now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good slap, though. Yeah. Yeah, you have to put break this up into two parts of the show, I think. <laughs> yeah, two weeks, three weeks. Listen, uh, thanks a million for jumping on. Don't leave it too long the next time. No, no, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. And thanks for everybody as well. Hope you're all well. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The team of OTB are taking on a challenge. A challenge that requires fitness. A challenge that demands months of training and preparation. A challenge that requires knowing when to push and when to focus on recovery. Triathlons aren't easy, but having a fitness coach helps. Whoop! For helping us non-athletes... You need all the help you can get. Yeah, yeah, as I was saying, helping us non-athletes feel like pros in our challenge to complete a triathlon this summer. OTB Sports, in partnership with Whoop. Unlock your inner potential with Whoop, the personalised digital fitness and health coach that provides you with actionable feedback on your sleep, training, recovery, and health. Check out whoop.com for more. This is Sport Ireland Campus, and here is where it all starts. From the little ones learning to the high-performance athletes leading. Here we go to play, to practice, to progress. Here is where communities in the nation come together to compete, to win, and to belong. Here we go to the next level, then on to the world stage. This is Sport Ireland Campus, and here we go. Visit sportirelandcampus.ie to be a part of it. The Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue is heading west and they want you to join them. Paddy, James and host Tommy Rooney are Castlebar bound on Thursday, June 2nd and just announced to be joining them on stage is the Mayo legend Keith Higgins. They'll relive old Dublin Kerry and Mayo battles at Croker and beyond as well as analysing Championship 2022. That's the Football Pod at the Royal TF Castle Bar. Tickets are €20 Euro plus booking fees. Get yours now at otbsports.com forward slash events. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar Alright that was something we made uh, a little bit earlier uh, Kevin Caban uh, covering on I mean there probably weren't too many other bases we could have touched on there on in that 30 minute chat No we got a lot done got a lot done Got through a lot Yeah Like the issues aired players chosen all sorts going on there. Yeah, felt felt. Uh, Kevin would be a good psychologist. Actually, he's picking away at the ginger psyche. He's so, you see, he's so nice. You kind of get you lure, get lured into being just too giving. Yeah, 
Yeah, we, we really did kind of watching that back there thinking, why did I give up so much of my soul? Uh, Flying Hellfish uh, said, has uh, um, been in contact with the Irish rugby team are tipped to take uh, one of the three tests against New Zealand this summer. I think they can handle a French club team on a Saturday. Series come from there. Yeah, 100%. Like they're, I like it. They're on paper, heavy favourites, 12-point favourites. And that is that speaks to the, the strength that they have. I don't think there's any team really in the competition this season who could be up against Leinster in this final and he wouldn't favour mm-hmm. Leinster. And um, as, as I said earlier on, there's a chance that 5 o'clock Saturday uh, we might actually be looking for one of the games. That could be a contest. Uh, Yazin says Liverpool should win Real lost to Sheriff uh, Tiriff's ball at home if Liverpool win it'll be greater season achievement than City's very lucky league title says Dahi I don't think you can really win a lucky Premier League it's just too long Dara saying um, who's the be- who is the best Lord Kev Lord of the Rings uh, the dance or the flies it's a conversation for another week yeah, uh, what's the what's the name of the the um, the novelty uh, Great British election candidate Lord? What's his name? Oh yeah, we'll have to we'll have to get googling on that one. While you're doing that, Tender Chicken says surely the best ginger footballer is Pat Spillane. Just a bit of a left field. You see, people, you only know Pat Spillane as being grey, although you probably have you had posters of him up around when you were I a kid. I he's more blonde. Lord Buckethead, by the way, is who <laughs> I was thinking of. John says, turns out Bruce Springsteen tickets are more expensive than Adrian Barry's cheese boards. It's true. No, actually, it's not. You haven't seen Adrian's cheese board for this weekend. Charcoal cheddar is what he's going for. Charcoal I don't know, cheddar. I don't think it's charcoal cheddar. Is more expensive than a, a Bruce ticket. Would it be charcoal cheddar? Charcoal cheese. I don't know my cheeses. Come on, what is it? So uh, I don't know. I don't know. It just came through as charcoal cheese. I need to look in and exactly see what sort of variety it is. Variety it is. Uh, Ninety-six euro, two hundred and fifty-six euro. Uh, says Joe for standard tickets. That is saucy. Yeah, cheese board of Bruce. Who are you going for? You got 130 euro to spend. Are you spending it on wine and cheese or are you spending it on Bruce Springsteen? I'd, I'd get a lovely cheese board and a nice bottle of something and park myself outside the RDS and uh, sit there and just consume everything. That is your home. That is your spiritual home, the RDS, of course. Um, right. A Leinster La Rochelle, obviously, tomorrow. And uh, we've been sort of uh, debating exactly as to what we're going to do in terms of covering this one. And we've landed on the idea that I'm going to choose um, a Leinster 15 based off players that, at least this is my understanding of what we're choosing here, based off players that have started in any of the five finals, and we're including a probable team for tomorrow. Uh, and the stipulation. Uh, as Joe Conroy threw down the mantle saying that we have to pick players who are at the peak of their powers for a one-off must-win match. Okay. Is that fair idea. enough? Good idea. So what we'll do is we'll go through the pack first, we'll yeah. give the uh, runners and riders and then I'll give my selection and then we can pick through any points of contention as you see it. Adrian Barry's all-time Leinster 15. Let's go. We'll start with the loose head uh, props and the options here are Keen Healy who started the first four and Andrew Porter who will uh, probably start tomorrow. So that's the options there. At Hooker, it's uh, Jackman 09, Richard Strauss for the following two, Sean Cronin at 18, our Ronan Kelleher tomorrow. Uh, the tight head position is between Stan Wright, Mike Ross and Tig. Ooh. Gets really competitive in the second row where you have at number four, Leo for the first three, uh, Big Dev in 18 or Ross Maloney um, for tomorrow, where at five you have Big Mal in 09, Nathan Hines in 11, Brad Thorne in 2012 and then James Ryan in 18 and 22. That is a particularly competitive position. Um, blindside flanker, we have uh, Rocky in 09, Kevin McLaughlin in 11 and 12, Scott Fardy in 18 and then Caelan Doris. Uh, open side, Shane Jennings in 09, you have Sean O'Brien in 11 and 12, you have Dan Levy in 18 and then Josh van der Flyer. I mean, Ah, uh, but there is like I mean, there's a pretty obvious. Uh, well, we'll, we'll come to it in a sec. Where one you you, you can shift people. You can from six you to can shift here. people on. Okay. That is true. To continue the team of the morning, you can absolutely shift people. Uh, and then at number eight, you Jamie Heaslip in nine, eleven, and twelve. Jordy Murphy in eighteen, and then Jack Conan. Okay, take us through who you've gone for here. So my selections are the uh, pack is going to be Key and Healy at loose head prop. Okay, that's bang. fairly straightforward. Bang. World class, Lion, locks on the scrum, good in the loose. Probably suffered a little bit after that hand injury in terms of his op- open play and obviously is ageing now and has taken a bit of a backseat, but I think that's a, that's a banker. Uh, Hooker was really 
tough and it sort of came down to two and I'm going to go with the guy who's going to start tomorrow um, Ronan Kelleher Ooh, interesting. I think yeah like tough a tough call the others all have uh, different attributes that they bring to the party but he probably has a little bit of everything more um, Sean Cronin a slander coming your way from Adrian no, 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 Barry no, no, of a no, Friday no, no, morning no, it's okay no, no. scrummaging uh, Jackman scrummaging the defence of Strauss the running of Cronin uh, he's probably the best all-rounder he's only 24 Yeah. so like look at, I know we're not picking a team for the future but you have to say that um, who's your sub? Is, is Dan Sheehan potentially Sheehan? your sub? <laughs> possibly oh. Poss- Strauss pr- probably, if you're pushing slander. me for a one-off big game sub I'd probably go with Strauss um, hey interesting that's that's Hoker Right, okay. Uh, Kelleher, who else? And then completing the front row is going to be tight. Okay, yeah. We don't, there, we don't really need to spend too there much was time no, on that. There was no great debate about that. Okay. Like, Stan Wright is obviously a cult hero. Mike Ross has won two Heineken Cups, uh, star, started two Heineken Cups, uh, but it's got to be tight. It's no great So it's the that. Healy Kelleher furlong. It's a, a recency that uh, kind of tints that front row. Not to say that it's not the, the best front row, though. Well, yeah, if, you, if you make that, you won't be making that comment at the end. Okay, I'll, I'll, let's uh, go. I'll put it that, that way to you. Second row, right, so you had uh, Leo Cullen, obviously, with the uh, first three Heineken Cups, and then Devon and Ross Maloney. And I'm sort of roughly sticking, I know we can be fluid, but I'm roughly sticking my position, and i got to go with Leo. I think you're talking about, like, a big game, the personality of the guy, the leadership... Uh, not to mention the qualities that he had around the pitch. I just think if you're talking about wanting to win a big game, he's a big game player and he's got to be in there. Interesting. That's that's a hair's breadth between himself and Toner, surely. I think, yeah, look, when you talk about peak of their powers, <clears throat> Devon probably uh, would run that close. Leo probably had more longevity in the in the, in the front line. Um, but no, I've got to be going for Leo there. And then on the other side... This was the Big Mal versus Hines versus Thorne versus James Ryan and I've gone for Brad Thorne. I think that... But you not just do Brad Thorne and James Ryan and be done with it. Uh, you could. You could. You could. That's what Coach Shane is going for. Coach Barry is going for Leo. Because look, at the, the leadership thing is I, I'm, I wouldn't underplay that. And look at when you... When you Look at the team I've selected to play this imaginary game. Yeah. There's leadership all over the place. Um, but, you know, the personality, the grunt, he's been there and done it. There's no big game nerves. He changed it. He, he helped himself and Shane Jennings coming back from Le- uh, Leicester, amongst other factors, was such a big thing in changing the personality of that Leicester team. And it's not a, like, nostalgia pick or, or whatever else. But I think you got to go for Leo. Okay, so Leo and Brad Thorne is your Brad Thorne, round. one of the greatest locks of all time. Paul O'Connell type figure. Huge influence on that squad. They all talk about it, including Devon, about the impact that they had on him uh, and a big game player. Like, considered one of the greatest locks of all time. He is the, lo- the lock at lock. He's the one that you got to start. I like that line. That's our headline. Uh, back row, um, Rocky versus Kevin McLaughlin versus Scott Vardy versus Kellen Doris. And I've gone for Rocky. Okay. Gone for Rocky at uh, blindside flanker here. Um, d- partly based on uh, the stats. Like, look, at he was a one-season wonder, which was not to say that he fell off a cliff either side, but at Leinster, he was in for one season. He played 21 games. How many Man of the Match awards did he win in 21 games? Oh, like, probably 12, 15. 14. Like, also, including in the that famous quarterfinal against Harlequins was man of the match and in the final as well and this Big, was before Alan Quinlan was picking man of the match in these uh, these games as well so there, there was no back row bias before before Alan Quinlan was picking man of the match and actually looking back at some of the highlights of the uh, of the semi-final against Munster there was a few little sort of uh, over and back uh, between himself and Quinny so much so that we've asked Quinny to do up um, his thoughts on uh, Rocky Elsom which I don't know is it standing by but we might come to it in a couple of moments um, Quinny's thoughts on, on the selection of Rocky Elsom there but yeah like, like a bit of an enigma off the pitch all of his teammates would be would talk about his um, how much of an enigma he was off the pitch like you'd ha- you would actually rarely see him at training and when he was there he wouldn't be doing very much and they wouldn't be mingled much off the pitch uh, never came back for the 10 year anniversary of the game when everybody else was there and you also have to remind yourself he was 26 when he was in Dublin Thought he was a lot older, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You look at those pictures, thinking maybe the guy was about forty-five, and and in that monster game, like he was up against Quinlan, Wallace, Leamy, like you know. So I, I think I think Rocky Elsom is. Uh, I think is I think Cole Stad is actually kind of underplays uh, how beloved he is in yeah. the, the Leinster fraternity. So so Els, Elsom's your six. Elsom is the six, and then you have Shane Jennings, you have Sean O'Brien, Levy, and Josh Van der Fleer for uh, open side, and I've gone for Sean O'Brien. 
like you could try and shift things around here to make room for Josh van der Fleer, but um, it be, it's it's essentially what what you're looking at in this back row is Rocky Elson versus van der Fleer as opposed to O'Brien. You could have shifted, and look, with most of these, the same with John O'Brien. If you wanted to make room, you could shift him around a little bit. He's obviously played in all the positions, and there'd be no problem with doing that. But uh, when you talk about the lock at lock. I think he's a lock in the back row as well. I think you have to make room for him. The abrasiveness, like a brilliant win- uh, runner in the loose, selfless player would often sacrifice himself uh, for for uh, the cause of the team. Just a quality operator in all facets. Also had that edge about him, hadn't he? Like a real bit of a, you know, if you talk about a little bit of a nastiness that you need in, in a big game, um, then he definitely had that uh, serious ability to sort of take a tackle and keep going. So, um uh, man of the match in the final in 2012 and uh, also like look at it wasn't really about this but certainly helped change the perception of Leinster as being a D4 team you know like was one of those that was very much at the forefront of that so um, I'm not arguing I'm not Brian in a great debate about that um, you're number 8 Jamie Heaslip it really has to be again. There was no who's who's second. It. Who was your second choice out of interest here? Conan. Conan. It has to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jordy Murphy started in eighteen, uh, but never really went on to uh, fulfil the potential that I think everybody thought he would have had. Um, but yeah, like I mean, look at you're right. I could have shift shifted a couple of players around there to make room. Uh, I could have left uh, Elsa out. Might have been the easy decision to make, but um, I just think for everything that he brought to Leinster that season, we're talking about a one-off game where you're putting your best team out and you want to go and win it. And like, look at some of this is about, you know, Josh van der Fleer me- might make an absolute mockery of the selection in a few years' time. You actually forget that he's 29 um, and he's been around the season, uh, been around the scene a little bit, has only really started to make the impact that he's having now in the last uh, year or two. Um, you know, there had been a lot of question marks about his bulk and ability against the bigger packs to, to operate. But yeah. That's what I'm going with. O'Brien, Heaslip, and Rocky Elsom across the back row. Yeah, it's good. It's good back row. I think you could. De- it's definitely not set in stone. I think there's definitely an argument to be made, but it's a it's a strong back row and so a good bench. Uh, absolutely outstanding bench. So half backs, obviously, it's going to be Sexton at ten. Who's who's your scrum half going to be? That there isn't even a competition at ten, as in there's nobody else to choose from. Like from across the five finals, uh, he comes in for Cantopomi in the that monster famously semi final in '09 and never looks back. So no debate. Uh, the options at nine are Chris Whittaker, who started in '09, uh, Owen Redden, who started in '11 and '12, and then uh, Luke McGrath in '18, and Gibson Park, obviously, who'll uh, who'll start tomorrow. So I have gone for. This was a hard one. I've gone for Owen Redden. This was a hard one. Like, again, Gibson Park has really... There's a lot of van der Fleer um, comparisons there in the sense that he's really come into it. He's changed his game a little bit in the last while uh, and, again, could make a mockery this in a few years' time. But right now, you know, going for a big game, uh, Gibson Park would not be far behind. Whittaker wouldn't be far behind. But Redden, like, you know, everything you want in a, in a scrum half in terms of that you know, excellent delivery, fast delivery, uh, the main things that you need. Never had the physicality maybe of a player like uh, Whitaker, who was the perfect um, fit for that time. Um, but yeah, Owen Redden is who I'm going for there. So an all Munster half back pairing at Leinster, Redden and Sexton. Who are you going for in midfield? An all what? An all Munster half back. Lim- Limerick and Kerry represented at nine and ten. Uh, will we go to. Will I I'll give you the options across the uh, the rest of the backs? Do it. Yeah. So at uh, fifteen, uh, Isa in 09 and eleven. Rob Carney in twelve and eighteen, and then Hugo Keenan. You Shane Horgan um, at uh, four, on the right wing uh, for nine and eleven. Fergus McFadden, Jordan Larmer, and Jimmy O'Brien. The other options there: Brian O'Driscoll, nine, eleven, twelve, and uh, Gary Ringrose, eighteen and twenty-two. Gordon Darcy. At inside centre, 9, 11, 12, and then Robbie Henshaw subsequently. And then you'd Luke Fitzgerald in 9 and 11 on the left wing, and he's at 12 and 18, uh, having started the other games at full back, and then uh, James Lowe. Okay, so 13 is locked in. That's Brian O'Driscoll. Yeah, so nothing, nothing to be said about him. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Who's your 12? <laughs> uh, who is my 12? Well, there are a couple of players who are going to be uh, very, very unfortunate to be left out of this. I would include Josh van der Fleer as one of those. I would obviously, <laughs> it broke my heart in, uh, I was up until four o'clock this morning on um, crying tears over having to leave Big Mal out of the team. The third player that I would consider to be exceptionally unfortunate not to make this team is Robbie Henshaw. 
I like the way you're you're just going to put aside some time to talk up Robbie Henshaw now because you've ruthlessly left him out of your team. The fact is, you don't think Robbie Henshaw is good enough to get into your all-time Leinster team. No, so that's, that's who is good enough to get in there. There is a cigarette paper between them, and I've gone for Gordon Darcy at inside okay. centre. It's it was it, cohesion between himself and O'Driscoll, I guess. Well, there is a bit of that. I think that in the grand scheme of history says that you know Brian Driscoll was an absolute star and oh, yeah, he played alongside this other guy but for anybody who was watching rugby over those years like Gordon Darcy was such an important player for Leinster such an important player for making Brian Driscoll the player he was and just never really got the praise that he should have got because of the guy that he was playing alongside um, but look there was nothing between them it was an impossible call I had selected Henshaw at one point and then I revised my pick could have gone either way um, Darcy um, uh, both of them actually have brilliant subtly to their play serious pace when it's required um, but I do think that it's a marker of how high that I regard Darcy that I've selected him above Henshaw who I think at the minute is one of the first names I'm I'm, I'm constantly having to find myself not tweeting about Robbie Henshaw because everything I just find myself wanting all the time to talk about how amazing he is he's an incredible player you've done really well to talk a lot about Robbie Henshaw here in a slot where if, you've awarded the jersey to Gordon Darcy if, so if, congratulations to Gordon Darcy if I Darcy was crafting this team. It, it's, there's such uh, fine margins between them it's possible if I was writing this team in uh, 36 hours time I'd be including Robbie Henshaw so it's okay if you don't think he's the number one choice number 12 in no, the history that's, of Leinster that's, that's, that's totally fine it is literally what you said so Darcy is your number one choice 12 nothing between Driscoll them. your 13 so do you want to go with the wingers here first yeah we'll go right wing uh, it has to be Shane Horgan really um, again what a player like very much of his time um, for some reason uh, Northampton 11 kicked endlessly to him thinking that he might be a bit of a weak spot they hadn't been doing too much homework he could play it any which way you want uh, a legend of Irish rugby um, who else do you go for like maybe Jimmy O'Brien in a few years time but it was another one of those that didn't really cause a huge amount of uh, scratching of the head so Horgan at 14 and on the left wing this is where I did a little bit of jiggery pokery and I've you could not have a Leinster starting 15 from the five finals including tomorrow that doesn't include Ease and Asewe. He's well, got to be say, on yeah. the team. You know, like, look, Luke Fitzgerald is another one for that uh, replacements bench. It's full of... Is it full of bags? No, it's not. We've got good even split so far. Um, very hard to leave out. Class player, like, renowned. You know, when you think about him, you think about the pace, but, like, geez, what a defensive player he was as well. Um, but Isa, you just couldn't leave him out. He would cut through the tiniest of gaps. <clears throat> Brilliant under a high ball. Uh, any player that you've ever heard that played with him that talked about, uh, about him was always talking about like what a skillful player he was um, intelligent player kicking penalties in the 18 final like had a bit of everything the beauty actually watching back some of his penalties yesterday he had this real lovely talent to just drop just give the ball just enough mm. never needed to be sort of kicked into Rose Ed just enough lovely little style nice little sort of pitch and wedge style about him um, and like I think we sometimes like forget that he won it for Leinster in 2018 as well. Yes, like yeah. I think so, sometimes we, yeah, I, I don't know. We, I, I think that we can sometimes just forget the the real contribution he had in the the critical moments for Leinster. Uh, and it's not sort of a token pick to put him in there because of the fact that again he kind of comes into that category when you think of him immediately, like Elsom as this cult hero in in Leinster. But he's just so much more than that. Um, how close did James Lowe come to making this? Not he didn't even figure by the sounds of things like ah. Luke Fitzgerald would have been ahead of him in the mix for sure. He, he, I didn't overly consider him. That's fair. Well, it seems it seems ridiculously harsh, but <clears throat> I had to make room for Isa. Like maybe I could have put Low on the other wing and leave out Shane Horgan, but again that would have been recency okay. bias. We have one more position full back. It's a head to head between Keenan and Carney here, right? Or um yeah, because I've moved Isa onto the wing uh, and I've gone for Rob Carney. Like, what a trio. Again, not much between them. <clears throat> if anybody was to select any of the three of those players at 15, there's no argument to be made. Uh, there are comparisons. If I pick Rob Carney, comparisons with the other two, very good in the air. Probably doesn't have the pace of the others, but like a real big game player. Um, you know, 2012, probably the best fullback in Europe at that time. Um, and again, you know, there would be a will to put Hugo Keenan in there but I do think again there'd be a bit of a recency bias there and I've tried to remove myself from that as much as I possibly could but for that reason on yeah, I'm going a, for Rob Carney it's a good, good team just to re recap it it is Carney Horgan Nasewa Bod Darcy Sexton Redden and then the pack is Healy Kelleher Furlong Leo Cullen Brad Thorne Rocky Elson Sean O'Brien Jamie Heaslip I think it's, you did well there it's pretty good and it's the subs bench is off the charts yeah it is good depth 
uh, we'll be very interested here. I'm sure people out there have opinions as to people that have included or haven't and uh, do lash them into us, whatever it is that, uh, whatever your thoughts on it, do fire them in ahead of the game tomorrow. Obviously, it's a quarter to nine. O to AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Uh, and a reminder as well of our competition uh, this morning and indeed all this week we're calling all cycling enthusiasts Skoda are the official main partner of the Tour de France and to celebrate here in OTB Sports we have a once in a lifetime giveaway the amazing prize is a VIP trip to stage 13 of the Tour de France it's July 14th to 16th and you need to be available to travel in those dates it'll also include flights and accommodation for one winner plus uh, a travelling partner. All you have to do uh, to be in the hat and to win today's prize, just name this Irish cyclist who enjoyed 17 years as a pro, uh, 24 grand tours. His dad was also a cyclist and he reached the business end of Dancing with the Stars. Who is it? You will still see people taking risks to get a shot on TV in some crazy costume. Just tweet your answer to us in here at Off The Ball or on the OTBM Twitter account. Each daily winner is going to win a 100 euro one for all voucher and a Skoda cycling jersey. <clears throat> and they're going to the draw for the grand prize as well. So best of luck on that. And Skoda drivers, by the way, uh, for another chance to win, you can just check out skodaservice.ie. We will give you a reminder of that a little bit later in the show as well. And we'll be picking today's winner as well as the overall grand prize winner. So that is a reminder of our competition. And as I said, all but thanks uh, this morning to Skoda. So do get your comments coming into us, whether it is about the rugby, or you want to enter the competition or indeed if you've thoughts about the Champions final, uh, Champions League final this weekend because that's where we're headed. It's uh, gone a quarter to nine and Gareth Roberts of the Anfield Rap. Good morning to you. Good morning, you okay? How are the nerves? Yeah, starting to build up now. Starting to feel a little bit nervous walking into work there to see all the flags in town and everything and it feels very close now. The I was interested to see after the game last weekend that Jurgen Klopp was talking very quickly, as you would expect. That uh, you know, once that was over, it's over, and we park that, and we move on, and there's you know nobody uh, thinking or talking about it too much. But the physical exertions of trying to get back against Wolves, Gareth, and the emotional roller coaster almost of the way that uh, last uh, 30, 40 minutes played out, which mostly the players would have been aware of, I suppose. If they come up short this weekend, that mad running, including last weekend, will be cited. Yeah, I mean, they've played midweek weekend every every match weekend since the middle of February. So actually um, getting a few days this week will be massive for them. So I think they'll feel like they're recharged for that reason for me. Because um, as I say, the schedule has been unbelievable. We play, we obviously will play every possible game that you can play in a football season, 63 games. But I think they've been careful with the minutes. I think they've managed it. And I think the performance against Wolves, I think you can just sort of discount it. Because as you say, they knew what was going on. They could hear the fans cheering. The football wasn't great. The heads were obviously all over the show in that game. But I think in Paris, they've had time to concentrate, they've had time to focus, they've had time to train and they've had time to relax. So I think we'll see the benefits of that on Saturday. Did you think they look leggy against Wolves? A, a little bit leggy, but also a little bit distracted. I mean, you know, they, they, couldn't, they didn't keep the ball as well as they normally do. There was passes going astray. I think they were, they were visibly... Um, affected by by us cheering Aston Villa goals in the stands, and there was even a a, a ghost goal, if you like, that went round the stadium mm-hmm. as well. And mm-hmm. you know, you, you could see when Mo Salah scored that he thought that was his big moment, that he'd won Liverpool the league. So, you know, the messaging wasn't quite right down to the pitch. Uh, Wolves obviously played with absolutely no pressure whatsoever and played quite well, to be fair to them. But yeah, Liverpool on that day didn't play well. But you look at how Liverpool have played in, in cup finals, in big games down the years in general, uh, I'd expect them to be on the money tomorrow night. What are you thinking in terms of team selection, Gareth? What are the big questions and what are the answers to those questions going to be? I think um, I think the big questions probably start at centre-half. I mean, Virgil van Dijk was obviously rested uh, for the league game in readiness for this one. Obviously, you want him playing because he's so key to how Liverpool play. I think it, who lines up next to him is a little bit of a question because, you know, Karate's done well this season. Um, and, and, you know, Southampton game, as, a, as an example, he played very, very well. And he actually he, he did a possible impression of Virgil van Dijk himself. <laughs> um, he wasn't so clever, I didn't think, um, the weekend's just gone. And I'd expect Matip to come in, to be honest with you, out of those two, just for this experience. Um, he's been brilliant. He's a cool head. Um, so I think he starts. I think the full-backs pick themselves. In midfield, there's a massive question mark because 
We're waiting on we're waiting to hear on the fitness of Tiago. Um, the news seemed to be relatively positive that he was in the gym. That it, you know the injury wasn't as bad as the first fear at the weekend. So we'll wait and see on that. Fabinho, we've seen him training, so you'd expect him to start, and that's brilliant. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see on Tiago, and then up front. I mean, again, there's a sort of there's a wealth of choices. There's five mm. five good strikers there, or five good forwards into three places. But I think, you know, in a Champions League final, I don't think you really mess about with it too much. I think you start Mo Salah, Sadio Mane and Luis Diaz because he's been the man in form. Does the five subs thing, I guess, lessen your fears about taking a risk on Thiago? Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and I think what Liverpool may do, obviously they'll, they'll run all kinds of tests on him. They'll be monitoring him all week. He may, it may be that they just decide to use him for half an hour. Um, what You know, second half or something like that um, and try and keep it tight up to that point um, so we'll, we'll see we, he might he might not be fit enough to play the 90 or, or it could of course go to extra time it could of course go to penalties so we'll see on that one uh, obviously if both him and, and Fabinho are being out the midfield that Liverpool would be putting out would be a little bit concerning but I think having Fabinho back is absolutely huge because I don't think anyone at the club quite does the role as well as he does. I think Henderson can job there, but is nowhere near as good because for me, um, Fabinho is one of the best in the world in his position. So to have him there, hopefully fit, fired and ready to go is massive for Liverpool. Um, and then, you know, I would expect Henderson to be there um, and then I would probably say the other one is likely Keita if it's not if it's not Thiago. And then if it's Thiago and Fabinho out, is it Keita, Henderson and Milner? Or... Probably, um, you could maybe make a case for for Curtis Jones, but you know it feels big that to ask that of him in a Champions League final. He's not played that much football this season. Um, I still think he's a good player. A lot of people seem to to not really rate him. I think that's unfair. But yeah, you would probably go with the experience of Milner. But when you look at that mid- midfield you just talked about there, you would say, well, it looks like it lacks creativity a little bit. So fingers crossed that that isn't the midfielder. I think I think we definitely will see Fabinho. I think yeah. I think that's that's nailed on. Um, and then Keita for me has done all right uh, in in recent times. He's another one that splits opinion a little bit. But you know he can get the ball moving. He can play between the lines. He's creative. And when he's on it, he's a force to be reckoned with. To be fair to him. How much if Thiago is out and like you say, Gareth? Like who knows? Is the half an hour in him? Is that the last half hour of the game? If he if he is out, what, how much does that shift your confidence about the outcome? I'd still be confident because you you know we've obviously played without him before. We've won we've won a cup this season without him. He obviously was injured in the warm up for the league cup, um, and ultimately, virtually every game I've watched Liverpool play of the sixty two this season, uh, we've seen all of them, and Liverpool create chances no matter who starts in midfield. Obviously, there's a big chat about the midfield. It's what everyone's focusing on because there's a bit of jeopardy around it. But you can't tell me that Liverpool aren't going to create a chance in 90 minutes if the midfield's a little bit different. They will do. They will do against this Real Madrid defence as well. We saw Man City score four against them in one match. Chelsea score three against them in one match. And both of those sides probably feel like they should have knocked Real Madrid out um, given the chances that they had in those games. So I, I don't see Real Madrid suddenly becoming this tight defensive unit that, that's able to stop our front three, no matter who the midfield is. Because obviously Liverpool can hit you very fast on the break. D- Diaz can ca- carry the ball as good as anyone. And then, you know, Mo Salah, well, we know what he's got in his locker and we know that he really wants to perform against this particular opposition. Does has last year's fixture between these teams come into your thinking at all this week? Like I know last year was such an anomaly for Liverpool, and when you look at that Liverpool team that played against Real Madrid in the first leg last year, when they were they were beaten, it was Phillips and Kabak at centre half. So you can't really ever judge that era of Liverpool. But Fabinho and Keita were in midfield. I know when Alden was the was was in there as well, and I guess there is this this sense that um, the the opposition uh, that they were up against is going to be the midfield that's going to start for Real Madrid or have a very good chance of starting for Real Madrid this weekend in Modric, Crows and, and Casemiro. So do you take any of the lessons around that midfield battle from last season and bring them into to this weekend? Absolutely, yeah. I think I think it serves as a warning, doesn't it, that you know you can get a little bit complacent about all this. Some of the talk around Madrid, I think, is over the top in terms of you know lots of focus on on their age, lots of focus on there's been a bit of a, a bit of, a bit of luck involved in their run to reach this stage this season. But you know the, the still Madrid aren't they? I think they've won the last seven finals. 
when they've reached the European Cup final, they've obviously won the competition 13 times. There's something about them in this competition. Um, and, and obviously they back themselves as well, which is why they're wandering around the pitch with a, a, a T-shirt with 14 on uh, straight after they qualify for this final. So they won't be short of confidence. Not, they're not short of talent. But of course, you know, they've got to be sort of allowed to play to an extent. And it, it's my thinking on it that, you know, I, I think when Liverpool played Chelsea in the FA Cup, Obviously, it went all the way and it ended up going to penalties and you're getting daft people on the internet with banter analysis saying, ah, oh, you'd only beat them on penalties. Um, but but <laughs> Liverpool, Liverpool blew Chelsea away in the first 10 minutes. They should have got the game won then. And I've seen Liverpool do that a few times. They obviously did it against Man City in the in the semi-final as well of the same competition. And I think it feels like it's a tactic at times almost to scare the opposition, get in the faces, score an early goal, set the tone. And I think Liverpool might try and do that in this in this game as well, and make a lot of the of this chat redundant. Hopefully, that's that's where I'd like it to go. Like I said to you before, I can't see Liverpool not getting chances. So it's a case of taking those chances, and they've been pretty good at that. Obviously, ninety four goals in the league this season, as well as their ninety two points. You got you know three players who are in in the twenties and thirties in terms of goal scoring. Uh, you know Salah thirty one, Mane twenty three, and Jota twenty one this season. But also there's there's 20 players, 20 different players at Liverpool who've been on the score sheet this season. So there's goals all over the pitch. We've been good at set pieces as well. Um, we can talk all we want about the threat of Madrid and, and how they will trouble Liverpool. But I, I would go for the Bob Paisley maxim of let them worry about us. Yeah, and uh, they can, uh, given the quality on the bench as well, they can uh, throw the kitchen sink at it if needs be uh, down yeah. the stretch. I wasn't going to ask you about to compare the trebles, Gareth, right? But then I read David James saying that the 99 treble, and if this one comes off, that they both deserve to be on the same pedestal, which had me thinking, is there is that a really a talking point? What's your view of it? I mean, you want to win the league, don't you, obviously? So um, if you're comparing a treble that's included the league then a treble that doesn't include the league isn't as good, uh, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Um, but equally, at any treble is brilliant. Let's, yeah. be, let, you know, let's not be daft about this. I mean, you know, we, we won one in 2001, and it's still one of my fondest memories of being a Liverpool fan, and that was the UEFA Cup, the FA Cup, and the League Cup. Now, you know, Man United fans described that at the time as a Mickey Mouse treble, I had a fantastic time. I went to most of the games that season. I went to all of the finals. And it was an absolutely superb season to be a Red. So there was no Mickey Mouse talk in my household. Yeah, there's always going to be a bit of needle no matter what's going on in that uh, in that variety. Um, <clears throat> the Sadio Mane stuff, obviously, and there's more developments now in the last 24 hours. But uh, his quote here, if people haven't caught it yet this morning, I'm fully focused on Saturday's game. That's the answer I must give before the final. But come back to me on Saturday and I will give you the best answer you want to hear for sure. It's special. I will give you all you want to hear then. That to me looks like he's about to sign on the dotted line. Sounds that way, doesn't it? And and fantastic if so, because I, I'm I'm a big fan of Sadio. I think he's central to what Liverpool do. He's been brilliant second half of the season for Liverpool. I mean, if you think that, you know, he obviously went to Afcon. Uh, he was in a World Cup qualifier not long after that. He's been around the world twice basically this season, uh, if not more. And yet, you know, second half of the season, I think he's got 13 goals since he came back from Afcon. And he's been, he's been essentially Liverpool's best forward, um, Liverpool's best player. So if he's talking about signing, it's, it's fantastic news. There's been this, obviously, jeopardy around the three contracts of the front three or the established front three for a while now. Uh, Fabinho, Sadio and Mo Salah are all, all expiring in terms of contracts at the same time. Um, Klopp already threw something out there which no one seemed that bothered about, which was for me, it was going nowhere and it didn't make any headlines whatsoever mm. for some reason. Uh, I still rate Firmino, by the way, I still think he can play a part. Um, but yeah, Sadio signing up, absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's 30, but he's still got loads in the tank, as you can see. And, you know, people are talking about him being a contender for the Ballon d'Or and things like that. Uh, why wouldn't you sign him up? I think it's interesting as well in terms of how these things play out in that. Someone somewhere was leaking something about him him being interested in Bayern Munich um, and Bayern Munich being interested in him. Now, joining the dots, is that coming from his agents? If so, well, you know, Sadio's not on the same him sheet here, is he? And he's just come out, as you say, and said something there, which very much sounds like he's staying at Liverpool. And if he is staying at Liverpool, fantastic news for Liverpool fans. Martin Samuel was writing in the Daily Mail this morning, Gareth, that um, this could be sort of the last dance for this Liverpool group and that, you know, they'll 
we've just been talking about contracts and who knows what happens it looks like most of the main players are going to stay but that that they're moving into a position where um, you know, it could become a fragmented team that they'll never be the same again it actually feels like to me looking at it almost the exact opposite Klopp has signed up Mane will probably sign up like that this group the, the Luis Diaz we're talking about starting the Champions League final not on the radar for Liverpool uh, only a few months back so it almost feels like they've been quietly building something that is going to be sustainable over the next four or five years almost yeah absolutely that I agree with you rather than rather than Martin there in that you know obviously already as you say Diaz has come in hit the ground running only going to get better um, Jota also has come in um, you know challenged the established front three you know got into double figures himself this season as I said before um, you've got Harvey Elliott who, who at the start of the season was first choice then he's, he, he's gone out of the picture but he's round and about he's ready to go he's clearly a talent so for me you know Klopp's already building the next version of Liverpool at the same time as fielding this one um, so I wouldn't be concerned about it being the end of something it feels to me like it's very much the start. I mean, all this debate that there's been all week around, would it be a disappointment if Liverpool didn't win this final and all this kind of stuff? My my sort of maxim on this has always been, and I've said it for years on the Anfield Rap, and before that I always wrote it in the fanzine that I did, if you're at this stage of the season and you, you're challenging, you're, at the, you're near the top of the league, you're in cup finals, and, and you're regularly doing that, you can't ask for much more than that. Sometimes... Uh, a cup final can be flip of a coin. Sometimes it can obviously be a penalty shootout. Liverpool have benefited twice from that this season already. Things can go to the wire. The the league can be mad. We lost the league by one point. You know, there's no disappointment for me because the club are doing what I always wanted them to do, which is challenge for honours on the regular. And Liverpool aren't going away. Like, there will be players signed in the summer and players will want to come and play for Jurgen Klopp because he's now on a longer contract as well. So... I don't really see why seeds are being sown of, of something going wrong or something changing. You know, Liverpool are 100% here to stay. Gareth, enjoy the game. Thanks, million. Cheers, boys. Gareth Roberts from the Ganfield Rap looking ahead to the Champions League final this weekend. Alan uh, says, to, uh, start Diaz on the bench. Jad and Firmino don't usually have much impact coming on. Which is fair enough. He could go for any combination of, uh, of well, it'd be either Jad or Diaz, I suppose. Uh, Andrew says, happy Friday, lads. You're helping you through the hangover. Working from home today, thankfully. Enjoy the weekend of sport. Brave move to head into this weekend with a hangover. <laughs> I'll take the edge off you for the weekend. No, that's it. So you can focus on the sport now. Uh, Tom says, can't argue with the selection. This is about the Leinster 15. On the field, Rocky was the best I've ever seen. Uh, as we know, off the field was a different story. And Lorcan says that uh, I approve of the 1-8 to eight selection. So um, that's it. Any more comments on that uh, Leinster 15? Fire the Mintos. We're going to do our GA quick picks very shortly. But before all that, we mentioned uh, Rocky Elsom and the enigma that he was and the impact that he, ha- uh, he was. We also wanted to get the thoughts of somebody who played against him in the latter stages of the uh, Heineken Cup, as Alan Quinlan did. I think back to 2009, obviously, um, not with fond memories of that that Heineken Cup semi-final against Leinster and Croke Park, but just the impact that that Rocky Elsom had that whole season with Leinster. Um, strange kind of a character, I mean that respectfully. It wasn't that open or kind of chatty with other people um, from the opposition, or and I've heard that from probably some of the Leinster players as well. He just kind of bounced in, bounced out, but uh, of training and matches, and but had an incredible impact. Um, what an athlete he was. Um, so quick, so powerful, and um, so many man, man of the match awards that year for Leinster. He just had an incredible impact, and seemed to be someone who kind of galvanised the crowd and became a kind of a cult hero for Leinster. Um, he was just exceptional, and in that semi final, he had a brilliant performance as well. I remember probably with ten minutes to go, I got a pass from Doug Howlett. We were attacking the Leinster line, got a little bit of space. Now it didn't look like I'd score, but. Um, the one player that came across and, and kind of made the tackle and knocked me into touch was Rocky Elsom. I think he's cover tackling, his ability on the ball and, and his speed and power when he carried was just unbelievable. So I played a league game earlier in that season down in Thomond Park and um, a ball slapped down from a line out and Rocky Elsom ran through and kind of grabbed it and I was trying to scrag him or tackle him high and he fended me off and took off. But thankfully the referee he blew the whistle and it was um, the ball was deemed to be knocked on because uh, 
I don't think I would have caught Rocky Elson. He was incredibly quick for a wing forward and uh, so much power, so much energy um, to get over the gain line and big and physical as well. So I think uh, just the impact he had on Leinster is standout for everyone. And we were very aware of that as Munster players trying to limit the space that you would allow Rocky Elson get or have with the ball in hand because he was so incredibly powerful and, and quick over the gain line and um, obviously had a huge impact in Leinster. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. Five past nine, that is the uh, cue for the quick picks. Ashley, good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian, how are you? Good, Tommy, how are you getting on? Morning, folks, how are we all? The big guns are back. What's happening? We all pumped for the weekend. What are we calling it? A wonderful weekend. We should like come up with some sort of marketing slogan right here. The big guns are back, I think, is probably the marketing slogan, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Who are the big guns? Tommy's. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Thank you. If, if I you appear distracted, me. if I appear distracted over the next half an hour, it's because I'm trying to get tickets to Bruce anywhere in the world. Oh. I'm kicking myself. Slept in this morning. I'm You're trying, trying to get them anywhere in the world? Oh, I'll go to see him in Rome, Barcelona, Amsterdam, oh, wherever. Cheaper in Dublin, at least. Well, Tommy, do you know that... Um, oh, sorry, which would you be more willing to pay €130 Euro for, a Bruce Springsteen ticket or one of Adrian Barry's cheese boards? Because that's what a commenter was getting in this morning, that they're r- roughly around the same price. Oh. Um, it wouldn't be around the same price at all. I wouldn't really have to think about that, Owen. It'd be Bruce yeah. Springsteen. Okay. I, unfortunately. I, I should get but I'm to... a big Bruce Springsteen st- a fan, you know? Like, there's, there's other people that maybe... The mic over the cheese board, you know, other people of Adrian's own uh, own standard of person, you know. Somebody be <laughs> <sitting here. laughs> what we're uh, I, I, one thing that I'm really surprised about is like Tommy is such a like theatre buff, like a gore, he's cultured, this sort of concert, like rock concert stuff. It doesn't really fit with the persona. <laughs> with the GA persona. <laughs> well, I think Bruce probably fits in perfectly with the GA persona. Everybody listening to the Quick Picks would be insulted by any Bruce Springsteen slander. To be morning. fair, they'll yeah. also be saying, would you get on with it? So we'll do that. I don't know, have we got a leaderboard? We got a leaderboard, we got a leaderboard. We have a leaderboard. Oh, I've never still seen Still Tommy. It. Let's not linger on that too much. Tommy's uh, got an asterisk beside him because he didn't do one of the really hard weeks. Exactly, which means he should really just tuck count. it there at the bottom on. You're absolutely right. I mean, if Tommy gets passed out this year by anybody it will be a Listen, humiliation for him that's, there's an asterisk beside Dublin's name in 2020 when they won the COVID on Ireland I don't think they'll care about that well there's an asterisk beside me in whatever year it was too when they threw the ball over the line so listen that's you know <laughs> still talking about exactly. that let's not get into that we don't, we don't care <clears throat> about that right um, Ulster final first up and wow we have three oh. uh, did I go for Derry <laughs> I definitely meant to go for Donegal um, Look at him scurrying away now, from boy. the ship. No, I, I definitely, I mean, I need to check back in my emails, but I definitely meant to say Donegal. So I, oh, I, I have no. Dairy. It's really three Donegal. Can I? Am I allowed you to change, change that? No, well, well, it's not, email, it's not, I'm not hold changing. Hold on a second. It. Hold on a second. If your email says, well, I can double check that says, while while flash Donegal. it up there again till we see exactly. Yeah, can I just can I just ask a question? Like Tommy, you weren't on. No, I went for Donegal. I can confirm you, I went for Donegal. You, you weren't okay, on. Well Tommy, you weren't on the quick picks when we did the preview for the Derry Monaghan game, and mm. I was wondering why you had jumped ship on Derry, and you stayed off the ship even though you were the one to tip Derry against Tyrone. So what's yeah. what what's happened here? Why why have you lost consistency in your belief in Derry? Um, I thought Derry had Tyrone in their crosshairs for months and months and months and I think I put too much stock in Monaghan and Monaghan's a, where Monaghan were at I thought Monaghan were primed for Ulster this year I thought Derry were maybe another year away I think I think this Derry team there's no ceiling on where they can go I just think they're not at their their gym in 2011 do you know they're Donegal in 2011 they're another year off can I throw I it out to you part. Tommy that they were they caught a bad Tyrone team at a low ebb and Monaghan kicked a scatter of wides, missed a load of chances. A couple of those go the right way and it's a very different conversation. Oh, oh I think I think that's true. I think when Monaghan put the squeeze on Derry, I was surprised watching that game back because I didn't see it live. I watched it back twice. I was surprised that Monaghan didn't catch Derry really in that second half. Now, that's not saying that I don't think this is gonna, game is going to go into the wire. I think there's going to be a point in this either way. 
maybe two points. I think Donegal are just going to have a bit too much this time around. I'm, I'm, I know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding myself doubting myself when I say it. I just think Langan. I think Langan and Thompson are going to make a difference this weekend. They weren't great the last day out against Cavan. They weren't there last year against Derry. I think one of them was missing against Derry when it went down to the wire. I think Langan and Thompson are going to make a big difference this weekend. I was at the Monaghan Derry game and I was so impressed with Derry defensively how they just frustrated them. Like we're talking about them not taking those chances, but they didn't get those chances because they were so frustrated. They There was always three, four men around one. Mm. And it, it was very tough for Monaghan to, to play the way they wanted to play because they weren't allowed to play that way. So uh, I do believe, I don't think this is a, in any way a flash in the pan for Derry. And um, we seen them coming last year. We all talked about it last year against Donegal, 15 points to 16 in Valley Buffet. And that was when everyone took notice. And now we're seeing they've bet the, the reigning All-Ireland champions. They've bet Monaghan, who uh, Monaghan have been brilliant all year. So I don't think that in any way we should be saying that, oh, you know, they just didn't take their chances or, you know, it was not a Monaghan team at their best or it wasn't a Tyrone team that are fully there at the moment, which, which they're not. But they have mm-hmm. bet two good teams and they bet them comfortably you know they really have so uh, I no I, I would back them the the whole way to be honest I think that they're 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 going to beat Donegal um, I do think wow. it's going to be I do think it's going to be tough for Donegal I do think they'll put up a huge fight it's massive for Declan Bonner he needs this big win it's their last chance it's, it's yeah, Donegal's last chance that's why I'm, how many last chances have they had though like I, I'm but this is this is it Owen this is their Declan last Bonner's chance. last chance yeah. I, I'm mm. I'm with Ashley on this one I'm absolutely buying the hype on Derry this year and you're right, it has been building for a while, but it feels like a five-year plan that has just sparked into an overnight success. That we know what's gone on under the surface, but what we've seen above the surface is just a, an explosion into life. And we know it's a lot more than that. I think the comparisons with the Jim McGuinness Donegal era are very, very interesting because that's what I'm feeling when I'm looking at this Donegal, or this, see, this Derry team at mm-hmm. the moment, is that I'm seeing that Jim McGuinness era Donegal the celebrations from Rory Gallagher, the uh, passion on the pitch from the players, it just speaks to me that we're seeing a team that is destined for great things. I'm not sure it's going to lead to an All-Ireland, but I think it's going to lead to an Ulster title this weekend. I think that if you look at some of the players that they have, these are not players that are overachieving. These are players in a number of positions that could arguably be some of the best players in their position in the country. Like if you see Mm. the likes of Rodgers, McCaig, Glass, McKinless, McGuigan, all getting All-Stars this year, you'd be like, fair enough. Like this isn't like some sort of flash in the pan where a team just comes out of nowhere and has one great year. It's like fair enough. Those five players in particular could be in the conversation for five of the best players in their position in the country. So this is what this is the standard we're basing it off. And on your point, Adrian, about you know the the, the bounce of a ball going a different way in, in in the Monaghan game in particular, you could say that about pretty much all of Donegal's games in 2012. The goal they scored against Kerry, fluky. The goals against Mayo, particularly <laughs> the first one. Uh, like I mean, there's th- th- there is the first a, one against Mayo was not. A fluke. To say, was what are you talking the, about? It's one of the great All Ireland goals maybe, ever. Maybe it was okay. Maybe not a fluke. Lacey to Murphy back in. What out. happened what in the second one? Talking about fluke. Second one, McFadden buries it. Like it's not a fluke. Like, but it, it was a, a bit of tactical genius. They targeted an area of Mayo's defence that they thought, right, we're going to get him here. I think a lot of I think a lot of Mayo people would say that those goals were preventable. But my point, Tommy, is that there weren't you, flukes. But my, my point is this: is that you can make a case of what if a team had done something better against that Donegal team. Yeah. What if they had been better under the high ball, is my point. And it's like, well, they weren't. And Donegal won the All-Ireland. And I think the same can be said for Derry over the last couple of weeks. The, the, the what-ifs around Monaghan, they didn't do it. Derry did it. Derry were the ones who, who buried <laughs> yeah, their goal opportunities. Derry were, Derry were the team who, who took their scoring opportunities. And that, for me, is the, the comparison between themselves and Donegal over the, the course of 2012, is that Donegal took their opportunities. And you could have no complaints when you come away from that year. And Jim McGuinness and that team our All-Ireland winner. So, uh, I, I apologise, Tommy, I clearly have offended you quite a bit there. Uh, not, not a fluke. I just love that Murphy. Uh, I just love that Murphy goal. It's one of my favourite All-Ireland But, goal. like, I, no, just, I, I just think disagree. those comparisons are, are really interesting and, and I'm getting the yeah. same feeling off, off this Derry team as I did in Donegal in 2012. So, I mean it as a compliment, Tommy. And not you can, as, you can not as feel it. Play. Like, when um, I was there at the, at the Monaghan game, you can feel the passion. You can feel yeah, there's indeed. something brewing. Speaking to the players, they buy into it big time. You know, they, they're buzzing and the likes of Garrett McKinless, what a player. He is that link man from defence to attack and he's he's scoring goals, he's scoring points, but he's setting people up as well and it's straight from the training pitch stuff. So everything is coming straight. It's no flukes in it whatsoever. You know, I don't think. 
and they um, take every chance I, as well. I don't think there's I don't think there's any flukes in it either. Mm. I just think that Donegal have a sting in them. I think when Owen lists out the, the dairy players there that could be the best in the country, you're looking at Patton, Murphy, Bon Gallagher, McHugh, McBrearty. Donegal have it on the same side. This is going to be a cracking game of football. It's going to go down to the wire. I wouldn't be disappointed if Derry were, were to win. I really wouldn't because I think they're going to have a say in the championship. Even if they lose, I just think Donegal... I've backed them a few times. They're not going to let me down this time. <laughs> That's the reason, Tommy. I uh, I just think that I think there's so much validity at Ashling. You've seen a lot of them up close, and uh, and that cannot be discounted. But who are you I, going for? I'm going for Donegal. It's, it's uh, that okay. it was written on the email, and I'm absolutely going for Donegal. Uh, I just think that there's probably a lot in what Owen is saying about a coming team. But I just don't think we've seen enough evidence of them playing enough against enough quality yet. And even Ashing's point about McKinless, I know Ian Fitzmaurice was talking during the week about the space that that Derry team were given down through the middle and the counter-attack particularly. Donegal are not going to allow that. They're just not because of the team that they are and because they'll have seen it happen in the previous matches. So um, that's why I'm leaning for Donegal. That's the Ulster final. Let's get into the Connacht final. And again, we have a split jury here. We have Adrian, Ashling, Owen, all Galway, and then we have Will and Tommy who are back in the Rossies. Uh, it is, it's the, the hardest one to call, isn't it, Tommy? Oh, is it the hardest? Yeah, yeah, they're both tight games. Derry Donegal, Galway vs. Common are tight games, Adrian. I think, um, yeah, they're tough to call. They're really tough to call. I think this one's going to be a shootout. Um, I just don't think either side have been fully tested this year. Mm. You know, Division 2... Galway looked like they were world beaters at times in Division 2 then they seemed to taper off a little bit towards the league final they seemed to have their eye on Mayo they did the job against Mayo but they just about got over the line so hard to know where Roscommon are at they're up and down from Division 1 Division 2 I think there's something in Roscommon when it gets to a Connacht final that they really believe in themselves and I think Roscommon I think not trying to be insulting here but I, I just think that similar to where Derry are at I think the provincial final for them is in all Ireland at the moment same with Monaghan. I just think those counties at the minute, it, it's just a huge um, a huge target for them at the start of every year. So I, I think they really back themselves when they get to this stage. Oh, yeah. Whereas with Galway, there's a, there's a very good chance you might have an eye elsewhere or you might get distracted a wee bit. I don't know. I just think I'm going to go with the Rosses here. It's whether you put more... The question here is whether you put more stock into the two league wins where it's coming to beat Galway or Galway mm. beating Mayo and I'm going with the latter. Yeah, yeah that's fair. This is it because we're we're looking at those two league games, but it's it is league at the end of the day. I know one was the division two final, but um, the likes of Shane Walsh only came off the bench in the in the last few minutes of that game. They weren't a full tilt, so I think after the Mayo game in Castlebar, they're still on a high from that game, and this is their best chance of going to win a Connacht championship. Portic Joyce is three years in now; he is no mm. silverware. He hasn't had a big moment yet. The big moment, I suppose, was against Mayo. But now this is the next big moment and this is their chance to to get this silverware and I think they'll be absolutely gunning for it. I, I do rate Ross Common. They're a brilliant team. But I think when the likes of Paul Connery midfield, you know, he's unbelievable when he gets going. Uh, Shane Walsh, Damien Comer, the likes, you know, it, it's tough to stop. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with Galway. I think Galway, to an extent, haven't been given any credit, including ourselves. Like, I mean, I think uh, Mayo are still ahead of them in the power rankings, for example, you know, just, oh. uh, just the curse you mentioned of that. That's a big thing. Uh, yeah. And I, I, think that, uh, I think that speaks to the fact that maybe we're still kind of holding our horses a little bit because, as you say, Ashling, it felt like Mayo was the final. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, like, that's not a criticism of Galway at all. It just, it, that was a massive game. That was one of the biggest games of the championship so far. Galway against Mayo is always going to be that way. But Ross Common have been waiting in the long grass. Again, I've, I've backed Galway, so what am I talking about here? I'm th- I just think that that league final, and especially the game before that in the league, I, I don't think we can read too much into it. As you say, Shane Wall's coming in late into that game, and Galway, I don't know, they just seem to concede these wide open spaces where all of the Ross Common forwards caused wreck. Every single one of them had a, had a fantastic day at the office that day. I can't see all of those Ross Common forwards having such a, a, a good day this week. And if they manage to limit that to, to three of the Ross Common forwards, as opposed to six this time, I think Galway win this game. I definitely. I, I think it's Galway's. I think that. Also, think that uh, it's sort of now or never almost for that Roscommon team, just given the momentum that they have behind them in terms of the league, the Galway results, the under twenties. It, it might be a very different uh, scenario for them in twelve months' time. So that's that one. Uh, we're moving into the Talton Cup now, and we're going to kick off here with Cavan Down. I mean, uh, there's no discussion to be had here. I think if Cavan come close to the um, performance they put up against Donegal, they get through that easy enough. And we've all gone for Cavan, so let's not linger on it. Leitrim has Ashton O'Reilly gone for Cavan? 
Absolutely. <laughs> that is surprising. Downer in all situations. situation. Let's not lie. She's trying to tell me double glove here. What's, what's let's, the linger, going let's linger on down here for a few minutes. Ash, oh, when you're okay, keep going. No, there is no, there's no conversation to be had. They, they're in uh, dire straits at the minute. I think every person in down will tell you that. And hopefully next year we, we'll see um, a bit of a difference there. But uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's sad to see that it's gone that way. Um, I think James McCartan, he is a great manager. He deserves a lot more respect. And I think that we'll see a big change. I think hopefully come next year we have to. But uh, yeah, no conversation really against Calvin. I don't think so. Leitrim Antrim. Uh, it is Antrim across the board here. Ooh. Ashling. Oh, I'm surprised with that. Oh, I went back and that. forth on this one. I, I wasn't sure, to be honest. Um, I think Leitrim at home and Antrim, they don't travel too well, if I remember correctly. I, I don't ever remember the travelling really well. So... Oh yeah, I was saying Leitrim and then it went back to Antrim again. Um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be much in it. I think it could go down to the wire. But uh, for me, yeah, I just I just about called Antrim. But uh, it was it was a close call. Was it a close call for you? Yeah, there's nothing in it. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Like I think the venue is the thing that was kind of making me sweat a little bit over this. But they were in different positions as teams. Like uh, it, it wouldn't have taken a whole pile of results to go different ways for Antrim to be in the mix out of promotion for Division Three. Um, so, like, I, I think that, that would have that probably says where they're at compared to, to Leitrim at the moment. So they they are in different places, I feel. But the fact that they're the games are on in Carrick and Shannon, the fact that Antrim took a bit of a hammering. I know uh, Leitrim conceded four goals and twenty points against Galway, but the, the hammering Antrim took was was severe as well. I, I don't know. I feel that there's like a lot of intangibles that I'm pointing towards here, where where I was a little bit nervous. But I think the fact that we've all gone for Antrim probably speaks to the difference that we we saw in the league at least, and the difference in class. Um, uh, Tommy's doing yeah. Tommy's like throwing Antrim out here and then you know listen to the football pod during the week he's going from Leitrim over there so he'd be going for a draw somewhere else when he's on another well no no no, no. Well, well James and Paddy both went for Leitrim did, and I didn't want to give them the kiss of death any time any time the three of us have gone for one team we were getting abused saying why on earth did you do that I think awfully lost the Clare 20s lost there's been two other teams that have blamed us essentially for all backing them at once so I had to think about this one I actually said Le- Antrim will win after extra time I think Carrick and Shannon's going to be rocking on Sunday, it's actually a game, probably the most interesting Talchon Cup tie that we've had yet. Two teams that aren't that exposed to playing each other, two young management teams, um, you know, with a, with a bit of a groove and a bit of momentum behind them. I think it's going to be really exciting down in Carrick and Shannon. And I wouldn't be surprised if it went down next time. Wouldn't be surprised if Leitrim won it. I'm surprised that everyone's going for Antrim. I'm surprised, yeah. like Antrim are 4 to 7 on. I'm surprised by that as well. Um, I think it's going to be a lot tighter than that. I just. I just felt like Antrim might just have that extra bit, having played in Division 3 in the last year and competed uh, in Ulster. Awfully Wicklow. Let's see if we have any points of difference here. We do. <laughs> Tommy, you're going Wicklow and everybody else is on Offaly. What are you thinking? Are you just trying to be contrarian? No. Um, I'm just not sure I'm buying Offaly. Just not sure I'm buying Offaly. I, I watched them in the league twice. I watched the game last weekend on GA Go against Wexford. I thought Wexford should have beaten them. Offaly definitely have some really good young footballers that are coming through. Lee Pearson has been sensational for them this year, but he's probably the only 20 that has actually made an under 20 that has made an impact, the only under 20 All Ireland winner. Like, McNamee, is, is, like, McNamee scored 1 5 last week without having the greatest game. Anton Sullivan had a good game. Johnny Maloney had a mighty game in, in centre back, but I just felt like Wexford still should have beaten them. And. I kind of like what I'm seeing with Wicklow. There's a there's a bit of abandon about them this year. They like their manager walked away in the league. Alan Costello came in. Um, they had a very good performance against Leash in the championship. Decent win the last day against Waterford. They're getting goals, and I think that might be important this weekend again. And I just think Wicklow are going to get the job done. Kevin Quinn, if he gets a hat trick again, he scored I think five or six goals in the championship this year. If he gets another hat trick, they'll definitely beat them. Young full forward, we're keeping an eye on. I need to get off the bottom of that table. That's Quick Picks. Thanks, folks. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time for them, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. Oh. Thanks, Emil. Right, oh. Uh, 25 past, we're coming up on 25 past nine. It's a fluid live situation here on OTBM this Friday morning. And uh, I'm going to give you a reminder of our Skoda competition in just a moment's time. But before that, I want to let you know that Dublin teams from all four codes are going to wear special one-off jerseys in their next matches. They're raising awareness for the Support for Drummo fundraising campaign that you've most likely heard about by now. Sean Drummond, former Kula and Dublin GEA underage player, he suffered life-changing injuries in an accident in London after finishing college exams in 2019. And the Sean Drummond Trust 
will use all the donations to help Sean regain as much independence and self-determination uh, as is possible and we wish them all the very best luck with that campaign you'll see it across the jerseys over the coming weeks and you can make a donation you just head along to their GoFundMe page search for support for the number four Drummo D-R-U-M-M-O and we wish them the best luck with that it's 25 past nine in just a moment's time we've got the uh, live crappy quiz coming your way it's myself versus JD versus Tommy uh, but before all that, a reminder that uh, we're calling all cycling enthusiasts all week here on OTB AM. Skoda are the official main partner of the Tour de France. And to celebrate here, we have a once-in-a-lifetime giveaway. It's an amazing prize. It's a VIP trip to stage 13 of the Tour de France. And it's the 14th to the 16th of July. So you need to be available for those dates. It includes flights. It includes accommodation. And you can also bring along one uh, lucky friend. So you just named this Irish cyclist to enter today uh, who enjoyed 17 years as a pro 24 Grand Tours, Dad's a cyclist, and you'll have also seen him on Dancing with the Stars. You will still see people taking risks to get a shot on TV in some crazy costume. So to enter, just uh, hit us up on Off the Ball on our Twitter account or on the OTBAM Twitter account. Uh, each daily winner is going to win a €100, Euro, one for all voucher and a Skoda cycling jersey. And they'll also go into the trough, the grand prize that I've just mentioned there. It's an amazing prize. Uh, best of luck if you're entering that. And Skoda drivers, by the way, a reminder for you, another chance to win if you check out skodaservice.ie. Right, here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio over the course of the day. Half past ten uh, will be the football kickoff, and uh, the lads will be marking a card for the weekend's games. OTB Gold from one Joe meeting uh, Ruby Walsh there. Three o'clock is live Friday night racing. Four o'clock, Shane Supple is the uh, subject of Team 33's League of Ireland Legend interview. Six o'clock, it's the football special on OTB Gold with Given Quinn, McIntyre, and Kilban. And then seven o'clock, off the ball live on your radio on uh, News Talk and across YouTube and all our social channels as well. The weekend lineup speaks for itself. It's going to be across all of the action. Uh, plenty of reaction as well, right across the Champions League, live commentary of the Champions Cup final uh, and Championship action as well. You can follow off the ball across our social platforms if you're watching us on YouTube, but you haven't subscribed. Do it now. What are you waiting for? Please uh, join the club. Hit subscribe for plenty more news, analysis, reaction and debate as well. And while we're at it, you can download the OTB Sports app as well. You can listen to OTB AM as a radio show each morning. It is 27 minutes past nine. Time for the crappy quiz. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? Jack Grealish is like taking the Freddie Flintoff mantle here and just... <laughs> And people always complain that football is a dull yeah. and boring, yeah. with no personality, you know, <laughs> the, the, the goodness has been coached out of them. We miss people like Paul Gascoigne. Enjoy him. Room 101, yeah. they were gone forever. Well, mine would be Saipan, the white suits, and probably Roy Keane. Oh! <laughs> Keane makes it all the way in. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. The Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue is heading west and they want you to join them. Paddy, James and host Tommy Rooney are Castlebar bound on Thursday, June 2nd and just announced to be joining them on stage is the Mayo legend Keith Higgins. They'll relive old Dublin Kerry and Mayo battles at Croker and beyond as well as analysing Championship 2022. That's the Football Pod at the Royal TF Castle Bar. Tickets are €20 Euro plus booking fees. Get yours now at otbsports.com forward slash events. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Chris Bond. Oh, you're kidding me. September. Kyle Wait. Lafferty. Are you no! joking me? Is that right? I know. Is that right? Uh, anybody else? Leash, was it? Like, that is one of the most stupid questions. <laughs> Darius Vassell? Seriously, you all need to just stay quiet. This is getting really annoying doing this quiz. What is going on here? <laughs> 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 Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome along to the shoutiest segment on Irish radio. It's the scintillating, it's the stupefying, it's the splendido crappy quiz. Every Friday we pit three of team off the ball up against each other in our no-holds-barred quiz of sporting factoids at the end of the week. Allow me to welcome today's contestants. Our first contestant is ready to kick some French ass this weekend. He's going to ceremonially burn a beret before tomorrow's Champions Cup final and then ruthlessly pour a full bottle of 1985 Henri Jair Richberg down the sink, <laughs> film it all and tweet it at Ronan O'Gara 10. 
you can't put a price on pre-match bans. But that 35 grand bottle of wine was admittedly on the sleep side. Give it up for Adrian, who's your daddy, Barry. I do need to be keeping note of all these wines that, because you're obviously doing way more research into wine than I am. What do you do? You just Google what's an expensive bottle of wine. Most expensive wine. That's what you do, and then just... Um, I'm feeling lucky then and to Google and see what pops up. <laughs> Our next contestant pretends to be a me GEA man, but his deep, dark secret is that in reality, he is a Claire GEA man. So, this week, he was particularly nervous when he went on Twitter and saw the hashtag GEA catfish trending. Give it up for the Mead Hillbilly Tommy Rooney. What a story. Need to catch There's up too many this. receipts. There's too many receipts out there. I just got tickets to Bruce Springsteen, so I only half heard that. I just heard GEA catfish. Whereabouts? Jesus. Uh, Dolan. Tuesday night. How much did you pay for them? Schiefer sorted me out. I don't know. She's out there booking them now. I don't know. I think you're going to probably... Schiefer, thanks. (laughs) You're going to have a hell of a revolute in your hands in just a few minutes' time. Uh, Our final (laughs) contestant is the broadcasting king of Saturday afternoons, such as his level of dominance that his rivals have started to run for the hills. What rivals, you might ask? Well, what about a certain Chris Kamara or a Mr. Mark Lawrenson? Ever think it's more than just a coincidence that they've decided to pack their bags when their schedules overlapped with this man? Give it up for John Duggan, a.k.a. Don Juggan. Thanks, Owen. And it's interesting (laughs) because Laro's left BBC and he's actually in here tomorrow. um, Oh, cool. We've Can't beat him, join him, John. Exactly. So he, he's, he, 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 the moment he, he left, he, he rang me up and said, I want to be on Off the Ball Saturday and he's talking. He's here tomorrow. Makes sense. As ever, the format is a classic crappy quiz with a series of questions on a range of themes and it's on to the rapid fire round, which is our slip and slide of trivia. You can podcast a crappy quiz on otbsports.com or on the OTB Sports app. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to click the thumbs up, even if we contribute nothing but misery to your day. Also, any postcards... Uh, with questions, we much appreciate it. You can send them to Crappy Quiz Quizmaster, Off the Ball Towers, Marconi House, Diggs Lane, Dublin 2. Round 1, as ever, is the boring questions round. Never multiple choice. Adrian, only twice has the final of the Heineken Cup gone to extra time. On both occasions, the trophy was taken home by the same team. Which team? Um, <laughs> Who did Cardiff play when it went to... Uh, was that the final? No, maybe that wasn't even the final. Decisions, decisions, decisions. I am going to go with... Leicester? No, it's not Leicester. Two lose. Hard luck. Hard luck. Tommy. Good guess. Can you name the most recent first-time champions of the Ulster Senior Football Championship? Um, is there any chance it was Tyrone? It's not Tyrone. They got off the mark in the 1960s. The answer is Donegal. 1972 was their first Ulster <sighs> Championship. So Should have got that. John, can you name both of the goal scorers in the last Champions League final that saw Carlo Ancelotti go up against Liverpool? Bit of a hint there. I guess so. Felipe Inzaghi. So. Yeah, that's one. Who's the other one? I, Inzaghi was, felt like a bit of a tap in, so that's why I'm asking for two. I think I remember. Kaka? No, it's not. Was it, it was Liverpool. Was, it, was it Dirk Height? It was Dirk Height, yeah. Oh, I Dirk thought you Heist. meant from Milan, sorry. that's I thought you meant both from Milan. Yeah, I was, I was confused. Well, then you should have said Inzaghi scored both goals, John. Yeah, and I was confused. 4.15am yeah. starts. Inzaghi, mm-hmm. which two count with Liverpool. So I get nothing for that? Nothing for that, unfortunately, John. I just, sorry for the difficulty on that one, but John does come into this quiz on the back of the Masters extravaganza last month, oh, which yeah. was utterly astonishing. Round but two. JD, JD is also sitting in Arthur, Arthur or PhD seat. He is. For last week. Arthur didn't is get there... a call up this week because Phil Egan was unavailable for the showdown. We will make that showdown happen at some point. Okay. The hype is just building. Uh, we need to get somebody to come in and actually become the kingmaker in this particular fight, even if they're their character. You're looking at me as in you need to get out of your seat and let somebody uh, else in. I'm, no, r- I'm round two. It. Round two is uh, Cullum's Wikipedia list round. Sorry, our Wikipedia list round. Uh, the game is simple. I will list from Wikipedia in order from first to last the clubs a footballer has played for. And all you got to do is guess the footballer in question. The first person to do so will win the point. So there's one major rule here. To avoid the complete carnage of a guessing free-for-all, each contestant must state their own name before guessing a player. 
Of course, this is the crappy quiz. So your names are your crappy quiz nicknames. We have the Meath Hillbilly, we have Don Juggin, and we have Who's Your Daddy. Failure to do so will eliminate the contestant. <laughs> so it's a free-for-all. We can all jump in. Yes, but you can only guess once per club named. Ready? So you shout your name. And guess, yeah. And you guess. Okay, so the first one. This first player started their senior professional career with Nottingham Forest. Who's your daddy? Go for it. Um... Senior professional Roy Keane No What? He like, then, can he be knocked out For that ridiculous no. guess? He then He also took ages there He then moved to Tottenham Hotspur He then moved To Charlton Athletic Who's your daddy? Yeah Oh I know who it is um, it, Too long I'm jogging Andy Andy Reed. Reed. Curtis Fleming. John Andy Duggan Reed. gets the point uh, Andy Reid oh. ah. Well done John you took too long there. I mean, you can't be coming in. You're not knocked out. You've given you got a first No, 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 you're not knocked out. You can get one per club. You can get one guess per club. You get one guess per club. Oh, per club. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm, I'm half Uh, So, not jumping in is a mistake, basically. Oh, okay. John is off to mark. Question... But no, hold on. Not jumping in. There has to be a limit. Like, you have to... No, no. Jump in as many times as you want, Tony. You have to have an answer. Come on. This second player started their senior professional career with Julius Berger. He then went on loan to Hill Vicente. He then uh, Who's your daddy? To Erling Haaland No He then moved <laughs> to Maccabi Haifa uh, Who's your daddy? Yeah um, Yassi Ben Ayan No He then went on loan to Hapoel Kfar Saba uh, uh, Mead Hillbilly Yeah <laughs> Over Femi Martins Correct No 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 What? <laughs> I was, I was, I, what? I was, I was looking at Oba Femi Martins for a different question, and I actually didn't end up going for it. Who's your daddy? Uh, he, de- yeah, Henry Glarsson. No, he then went on loan to Portsmouth. He then moved permanently to Portsmouth. Oh, uh, he, uh, who's your daddy? Yeah, uh, Benjani. No, no, he then moved <laughs> to Middlesbrough. <laughs> Mid Hillbilly. Yeah, <laughs> Don Juggan Pubu. Yes, Don Juggan oh. gets it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how could Don Juggan jump in when I had the Well, you took too long. Yeah, I'd also get the wrong answer. Okay, John has uh, opened up a two point gap here. This final player started their senior professional career with Birmingham City. He then Who's moved. Your daddy? Yeah. Kenny Cunningham. No, he then moved to Crystal Palace. He then moved to Everton. Meet Hillbilly. Yeah. Townsend. No. He then moved to. Who's your daddy? Yeah. Uh, Alan Stubbs He then moved to Fulham Who's your daddy? Yeah. Scott Parker No He then moved to QPR Who's your daddy? No uh, Yeah f- <laughs> <laughs> Say it, give me go, a minute Go for it Ferdinand No He then finished his career by moving to Crystal Palace Anyone? Going once Yeah uh, Scott Dan No Going once Going twice Meet Hillbilly Gone No you, no, you can't have a the second answer guess answer was Andrew right. Johnson That was hard Round three is the past the parcel of doom round. In this round, Jeez all you got to do is give me a name that's on a list of names. I have the parcel of doom and it passes on to the next contestant who then also has to give me a name. Uh, we'll keep moving it on until you get a, a name wrong or you can't give me a name and then you're eliminated. The last man standing gets the point. Adrian, you kick us off in the first one. Can you name a team that has appeared in the European Cup slash Champions League final but has not won it? Has never won it. Has never won it but has made the final. Um, gonna need to ask you. Come to on, quite uh, prompt, knock him yeah. out. Knock him out. No, no, no. Five, no, knock out. no, no, no. Four, um, three. No, no, no. Hang on, hang two, on, hang on, hang on. One. PSG. Correct. It goes to Tommy next. Fulham. Fulham is not oh, correct. I've... No. Oof. What? Fulham lost to a Europa Fulham League. Lost what did you? What was the question? European Cup slash Champions League. Yeah, Tommy, get with it. <laughs> oh Jesus! John, I dropped my pen. I just misheard you. Uh, Stout, uh, it was um, Sampdoria. Sampdoria is correct. What well, he said, Stow. <laughs> he said, Stow. <laughs> no, no. How no, can no. you go? Stout, well, no. To be Stout. fair, the word, word, words, first words out of his mouth. Adrian, come on. No, no. The first, ah. come on. We got to go with the first words out of his mouth here. Come he said on. Sampdoria. The first full club he said was Sampdoria. Jogan, come on now. Stow. Adrian. He said Stow. <laughs> Uh, but I've never won it. Uh, we go with 
Borussia Mönchengladbach, no? Correct. 1977. Well done. Should make Paul O'Connell impression there. Yeah, but very good. John? Eintracht Frankfurt. Eintracht Frankfurt is correct. 1960. Um, he said Stow. <laughs> Come on, Adrian. Nantes. Nant is not correct. John gets the point. <laughs> uh, their full list. Arsenal, Atletico, Bayer Leverkusen, Club Brugge, Fiorentina, Leeds United, Malmo, Man City, Monaco, Panathinaikos, Partizan, Rez, Roma, San Etienne, Tottenham and Valencia. What about Stow? <laughs> Tot- uh, Tommy rather. Uh, and a shout out to YouTube commenter 123456 who suggested this one last week. Can you name a club that has been relegated from the Premier League ever? This is a long list. Ah, oh, stop. This is we, ridiculous. We, we need to be quick here, Tommy. So you're first. Leeds. Leeds is correct. It goes to John next. Ipswich Town. Ipswich Town is correct. Birmingham. Birmingham, yeah. Swindon. Swindon is correct. Charlton. Charlton, yeah. Preston. Preston is not correct. <laughs> no, Jesus No, Christ. Preston have never been in the Premier League, therefore never relegated from it. Uh, so it is Tommy next Portsmouth Portsmouth is correct Wolves yeah Sunderland yeah Swansea yeah uh, West Ham yeah Nottingham Forest yeah um, did he say someone said Southampton no that's fine John Blackpool Blackpool is correct Norwich Norwich yeah Bolton Wanderers Oh, he's going at some clip here, lads. Tommy. West Brom. West Brom. Yeah, you're keeping the pace. Um, Portsmouth. Has been said. Oh, you're out. Get out. Tommy gets Get the points. Are you sure you want, to, you want to give John another chance there, do you? Oh. Sure? Are you sure? <laughs> John, uh, you kick us off on this one. Can you name any uh, team that has won a provincial men's football final this century? In, in any county? Like Kerry? Yeah, correct. Adrian. Dublin. Yeah. Mead. Yeah. John. Cork. Yeah. Mayo. That's correct. Where's Common? Yes. Tipperary. Tipperary is correct. Yeah. Um, Tyrone. Tyrone is correct. Cavan. Cavan is correct. Arma. Yeah. Donegal. Any goal? Um, so Kerry, um, Galway. Yeah, correct. This entry, um, do 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 do. Did I? Were Galway, Roscommon, were said Sligo. Correct. Great guess. Who's next? Uh, it's Adrian Monaghan. Monaghan is correct. We have three left. Can we complete the list? I have. Um, three left. Three left. The was. Uh, was Tyrone said? It was. What do you, what, no, but you can't. You got to give your answer. You can't ask that question. Okay, so that, uh, from now on, what we're doing okay, is first, okay. first he, he should be, okay. I technically, sorry, he should be out sorry. there. Stow, 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 <laughs> stow. Hold on a second. He should Westmead. be out, JD. First, first county you say is your answer. Westmead. Correct. John. Leach. Ah, oh, you are kidding me. I was sitting on the two of them. Adrian, there's one left. We've never completed a pass to parcel except for that one time. Come on, Adrian, you can do it. Come on. I was literally sitting on Leach and Westmead there as my, my two backup bankers. Come on, AB. Stow. If you don't get this, I'm giving uh, Tommy and John both a point. Ah, are you kidding me? No, I'm not. You can't do that. I can't. That's yeah. an asshole of a thing to do. I know, yeah. <laughs> and Tommy should also be out. Can I not be first to say it? Get the point. Um, I'm going to go with Claire. No, it was Kildare. Uh, so, John, you're up to four points. Tommy, you're up to two. Who said the Lancer Championship was dead, eh? For round four is the fun free magic number round. Contestants get three points for getting the number exactly right. If no one manages that, the nearest contestant who doesn't go bust gets one point. Uh, gets two points. The second closest gets one point. I'm going to say that we can only accept the answer that's written on your paper. And I'm going to have to ask for your pens once the music ends. So if you don't mind, give us the following number. It's the number of times Derry have won the Ulster Football Championship. Plus the number of majors Justin Thomas has now won in his career. Plus the number of times Liverpool have won the European Cup slash Champions League. 
plus the number of times the Golden State Warriors have won the NBA championship in the Steve Kerr era. Your 30 seconds expire when Sinatra sings bright shiny beads. So how many times have Derry won the Ulster Championship in football? How many majors has Justin Thomas won? How many times have Liverpool won the Champions League or European Cup? And how many times have the Warriors won the NBA Championship with Steve Kerr as their head coach? Add them all together, what do you get? Tommy, we'll go to you first. Why is it always me first? 15. 15. 18. 18. 22. I, 22. I had 18. John I Duggan banging the money. It's 18. Uh, he moves to seven I points. Had 18. Do you want I to take us 18. through them, John? Derry have how many? I, I had Derry down as, I think, seven. Seven is correct. Justin it's Thomas. Eight. Two. Two. Uh, Liverpool. Uh, six. And Warriors. Six. Uh, whatever. The, what, uh, three. A four, it was a three. Yeah, yeah, three. Yeah. Three titles so far. They're in the finals this year. So 18 is the total. John, you're on seven. Tommy, you're on two. Adrian. You're on nothing. Our winner tonight will be decided in the no team in particular ridiculously easy rapid fire round. So the score you get in this round will be added to your score in the previous round. 40 seconds for everyone to answer from the same set of questions. We're going to start with John, then on to Tommy, then on to Adrian. If you get a question correct, I will ask you another question and keep asking you questions until you get one wrong. And once you get a question wrong, I move on to the next person and you get deducted a point. John Duggan, are you ready? Yes. 40 seconds starts now. Name the only team to have ever beaten Leinster in a Heineken Cup final. Saracens. Correct. Who did Liverpool beat in the quarterfinals of this year's Champions League? Um, time, time, time. Too long. Time, time. Yeah. CJ Hamilton plays for what club, Tommy? Uh, Blackpool. Correct. Who was named under 20 Footballer of the Year this year? Rory Canavan. Yeah. Correct. Who won the Women's Champions League this year? Barcelona. No, Leon. Who won the Leinster Hurling Championship last year, Adrian? Um, Kilkenny. Correct. What club did Liverpool sign Ibrahima Kanate from? Yes. Uh, no, Leipzig. Time. Uh, time. Aaron Cashin plays for what English club, John? Eric Cashin. Time. Aaron. Uh, that doesn't matter. You won. Give me one more. Give me one more. Give me uh, one more. No, no, I'll save them for next week. You're done. Yeah, you're the done. lessons you have to do next week. Wait, well, how many points are in it? How many points are in it? Uh, John won it with uh, seven points. He stayed on seven points. Tommy, you finished up in three points. And Adrian, you finished on zero points. I had eight. Congratulations, written, John. JD. Sorry, I had 18 written. I had 18 written, and I ah, fifth me auntie and all that stuff. Go away John Duggan with a casual beatdown this week once again. It's like Dublin versus Mead a few weeks ago, all over again. I uh, just like you know. He doesn't even care. Look at him. He doesn't even care. Yeah, uh, I mean he's got. Tom, you're going to Bruce Springsteen. It's all okay. He's got bigger fish yeah, to fry. Right. Thanks, John. Uh, we should say before we wrap up, uh, our first road show in early three years is here. The football pod have added. Uh, Mayo legend Keith Higgins to the lineup for Castle Bar on June the 2nd. Uh, so Paddy and James and Tommy, of course, are going to be there. A brilliant night of football chat and plenty to focus on Mayo. It's a football pod with Paddy, James, Tommy and Keith in Castle Bar on June the 2nd. Tickets are €20 Euro plus booking fees. Go to otbsports.com forward slash events now for more. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're back on Monday morning from half past seven with Mark Lawrence and Alan Quinlan, Anthony Moyles and much more this morning. We're leaving you with Tim Vickery. Have a good weekend. And with that in mind, and to talk about a bit of the Copa Libertadores and restructuring in Brazil and all life uh, in Brazil and in Latin America, we have Tim Vickery on the line. How are you, Tim? I'm very well. Very good evening to you. How are you doing? I'm all right. What's the weather like down there? Well, we're, um, we're coming up to winter, which means, and I don't expect sympathy, um, it's around 25 degrees. Um, but as we get now towards the end of the afternoon, temperatures are going to dip alarmingly. I mean, I'm expecting quite a cold night where it may even get down to about 15, 16. How are you going to survive? I don't know. I don't know. We'll, I'll, I'll make of it the best that I can. So the, the Champions League final will start with, what, what's it like in Brazil when the Champions League final is on? Is everyone kind of glued to it or what's the atmosphere like? Does everyone go to the street? Do they go to the bars? Where do they go? Well, there's a reason that this game was switched from Wednesday uh, afternoon, your time, to Saturday evening. And that's that the rest of the world, it's easier for so much of the rest of the world to see it, especially including the Americas, because uh, um, it used to be when it was a Wednesday final, it's during work time in the afternoon. Now we've got it Saturday afternoon, prime time. Uh, and it's, it's a huge, huge game. For, for a number of reasons. And one, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous game in itself. Two is that um, European football has sold itself so well over here that irrespective of whether there are any South Americans on the field, uh, the, the fans over here, a lot of the fans have a relationship with the clubs. 
uh, and, and are desperate to see what happens. And three is, you said it earlier on, Johnny, a South American theme. There are lots of South American players on the field. So uh, um, we want to look at them uh, with a view, perhaps, in some cases, to the World Cup later on this year. Obviously, that doesn't apply to Luis Diaz of Colombia because uh, they didn't get there. But uh, there's a lot of Brazilians out there and a Uruguayan as well. So there are plenty of reasons for a South American audience to follow this game. What are you, like half your lifetime living there now or so? It's not far off that way. Yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, but I still think of, of England and, uh, as being home. But it, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching the halfway point, yes. What's it been like, like such a transformation? Living over here? Mm. Um, it's uh, Even though I've been, been here for for 28 years, it would have been half my life, but I've just turned 57 yesterday. Uh, so Happy we're not birthday. quite there yet. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't, even though I've been here all this time and I'm married to a Brazilian and I've got two Brazilian stepdaughters who, you know, they're, they're in their mid thirties now, but they've been in my life for, for over 25 years. I still can't see it entirely as home really because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, the product of a, of a different thing. I'm the product of something that doesn't really exist anymore. It's called the welfare state. I'm a product of, of council housing. I'm a product of, of free education. I'm a product of going to university uh, and uh, it, every, ha, having everything paid. You actually paid you to go there. Um, those kind of examples for my class of people in Brazil don't really exist. Not sure they exist too much in the land of my birth anymore. But uh, the, the lack of kind of social democratic values means that however much I enjoy being here, I never feel entirely at home. That difference between rich and poor and also the way that the fear of violence corrodes the social spirit, makes it harder to wander around freely. That means that uh, despite all of my affection for the place, and it is a love-hate relationship, I can never really fully think of it as home. So if you're a Westerner, do you feel a little bit unsafe walking the streets at night? Well, everyone does. I mean, it, and it means that there, there are far fewer people walking the streets at night, which in turn makes it less safe. Um, yes, I mean, that, 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 has, that has really corroded. And when I was first over here, and we're going back now to the mid-90s, I would give English classes to, uh, to executives who are the age that I am now. And they used to laugh at New York for its lack of safety. Um, this is something which has happened in Brazil in the last, it's a dynamic of the last 40, 50 years. Um, and it, it, it has to do with growing population, cities growing even when, when their economies shrink, a lack of opportunities, dreadful wealth distribution. The great historian Eric Hobsbawm described Brazil as the, the world champion of, of economic inequality. Uh, we, we did make progress a few years back, but that's, I'm afraid, we've been in reverse gear for the last few years. Football show is brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport, and Premier Sport. And in that context, then is is football still the way out for um, you know? I guess impoverished kids. We we'll talk about Luis Diaz as well because he's a great example of this in Latin America. Mm -hmm. But is is football still that outlet for everyone to kind of become equal? Oh well, to, for everyone to, to to get a shake and and to buy a house for their mum and extended family, it worries me. This sometimes the the responsibilities that are placed on young footballers when they show some talent. And there are plenty of cases of uh, of promising young footballers, you know, at the age of like 15, their entire family, uh, well, some of them, would they'll give up work and they will just become his support structure. And that that's putting a lot of pressure on a young man at an age when he should be playing football with the accent on play. They're almost like, sometimes, they're almost like soldiers on a mission. And Vinicius Junior certainly fits in into that category. And luckily, he's so good. And football is such a great game that I think he enjoys himself hugely on the field. But it comes loaded with so much pressure to succeed, not only for himself, but for also to, also to guarantee his extended family. That's quite mad when you think about it. I mean, yes. you know, back in the day, football was, for most of its existence, was basically a part-time pursuit for most of the players. And, you know, they had their job in the day and whatever. Now you have almost like an entire family hinging on your success. At the age of 15. I mean, mm. that it's it, it's insanity. And it, will, and it certainly doesn't make for long-term mental health. Mm. You wonder where there will be a reaction somewhere down down the line. Of, uh, uh, I have a friend journalist who uh, he, he went into this deeply with the Vinicius Junior generation. Uh, another one, uh, Paulinho, who's... Uh, Similar generation went to Germany, went to Leverkusen. 
Uh, and he came back very, very worried after talking to them because one thing that they can't do at the age, at that age, you know, 13, 14, 15, they're not just not allowed to play football in the streets with their mates. They're not allowed to do it because it, it's an activity that comes full of professional responsibilities at that very, very early age. So when we look at this game on Saturday, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to a fabulous, fabulous game of football. Uh, you know, it's so easy to envy these players, the amount of money that they get. But I re we really should remember, firstly, that the vast majority fall by the wayside. And, and secondly, that even for those who don't, there is a price to pay for all of this success on the field. And he was like, I mean, you just looked at him. He's turned 22 this summer, um, comes from kind of the southeast of the country. Um, and... It's. I mean, we we'll obviously talk about Diaz, but he he's an amazing player to watch, and he almost he does seem to play like with almost like a free spirit in in a not 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 quite the way that you you suggested he was brought up in terms of all the pressure on him. Yeah, and I, I've followed him all the way, and mm. I remember Real Madrid buying him before he played a, a a professional game for for Flamengo, and they spent over forty. I think it was forty five million euros. How does that work, Tim? Well, I, I think the reason was. Real Madrid were so miffed at having missed out on Neymar mm. that they were going to make sure that they weren't going to miss out on this one. So they were quite prepared to pay massively over the odds because at that point he was 16. He hadn't played a professional game. There was no way of knowing whether he'd develop into, into what he is now. And uh, I remember his, his first game. I was in the stadium for it. He was on the bench and he'd already been sold. Real Madrid couldn't take him until he was 18. So for the first like 18 months of his career, he, he was he was here in Brazil playing for Flamengo. And he was on the bench and the fans spent the whole game calling for him. They just wanted to see him. They wanted to see this, this, uh, this 45 million euro teenager, 16 year old. And he came on for the last 10 minutes and all he did, he, he tried to run through his repertoire of tricks and none of them came off. And by the end of that 10 minutes, he was already being booed. So he's had, he'd had his first, his first cheers and his first boos in his first 10 minutes of, uh, of, of uh, professional football. As time went on, you began to see that, yes, there really is something there. At first, it was hard for him to add precision to his pace. It's very difficult to be precise when you're traveling at the speed that, that he travels. But I remember one game clearly. Again, he came off the bench. It was a, a Champions League game, Copa Libertadores game, um, away in Ecuador against Emelec. And Flamengo were losing. And he came on and he, he won the game. He, he was astonishing. And the great thing there was that at the final whistle, the home fans, the fans of Emelec of Ecuador, they queued up to have their photo taken with him. They weren't angry about the, the fact that this, this, this player... This teenager had come on and won the game against their side. They recognised one of those rare moments where they recognised that they had been in the presence of something special, and they wanted to go home with a souvenir. And 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 for me, the the matchup between Vinicius Junior and Trent Alexander Arnold for me it's the most important matchup of the game. Remember when these sides met in the quarterfinals last year? Vinicius Junior won the game. 3-1 in a Bernabeu, it was nil-nil at Anfield and Real Madrid went, went marching on. And I'm fascinated to see what happens with this matchup. How will Liverpool play it? Because and Vinicius, the, the speed, Trent Alexander-Arnold is, is a magnificent player, but defending is not his strongest suit, is it? And he, and he would rather go forward. And if, if you are Liverpool, you would rather him do what he does best and not more of what he does not so well. So if they're going to free Trent to go forward, they've got to have someone covering that space. But also, they've got to stop the supply line. And that came in the Bernabeu when Real Madrid won 3-1. Vinicius' supply line was Tony Kroos. It could be Modric. It could be Casemiro. It could be Valverde. No, they've got all kinds of options. And Real Madrid have shown time and time again in this campaign, they don't have to be better for the 90 minutes to, to, to win the match. So the conclusion that I would draw for that is that Liverpool have to press relentlessly. So they can't be the Liverpool at kind of half cock that they were in the first half against, against Villarreal in Spain, where they nearly let things slip. And the conclusion that I draw from that is that we are in for a special, special game. Bring it on. I can hardly wait. 
I don't think Liverpool are capable of pressing relentlessly at this stage of the season. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. I think their legs are slightly on the wane, which is entirely understandable. Like at this stage yep. of the season, um, maybe, maybe, maybe so. And also the fact that Klopp has, you know, frequently spoken about Trent Alexander-Arnold's defending as not being an issue. But I completely agree with you. I think you know, in in a matchup like this, he's vulnerable. So if do Liverpool, are they going to like break from their high line a little bit? Are they going to be a little bit more conservative? Are they going to do what you do, Tim, and just press the crap out of uh, Real and hope for the best? Well, I, I would hope it's option number three mm. for you know for really getting a game. I, I, say, I, I hope we don't get a Liverpool that, that that's more cautious. Uh, but I think your observation is very pertinent. You know, the, the the time of the season, how much do Liverpool still have in in their legs? Uh, so. But these are big choices, aren't they? And they're, they're choices that are based around of all the great players. This is a, these are choices that I think are based mainly around one player, which is Vinicius Jr. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar.